Okay, Chair Kennedy, please begin when you are ready. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Civilian Oversight Commission public hearing today. I want to uh, start off by wishing everyone a happy St. Patrick's Day. And I, uh, I have the pleasure of introducing our uh, newest appointee to the uh, Civilian Oversight Commission uh, from District Number Two, Supervisor Mitchell's district. We have a new commissioner uh, who is joining us, Jamone Hicks. Uh, Jamone <laughs> is a trial lawyer extraordinaire. He does civil, including uh, police misconduct work, and he's represented the accused in criminal cases. He is a uh, partner at Douglas Hicks Law Firm, and uh, perhaps most importantly, a much loved alumnus and sometimes adjunct professor uh, at Loyola Law School. So Jamon, uh, uh, we are all thrilled to have you join us. Uh, I am honored to introduce you and I'm gonna uh, give you the floor to make some remarks. Okay, can everyone hear me? Am I okay? All right, well, thank you, Professor Kennedy. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity. I'm looking forward to meeting everyone. I, I've had the opportunity to meet uh, Mr. Williams and, and a couple of the other commissioners. So I'm honored to be here. Um, sorry, I'm actually out of town, so I hope my lighting's okay. But uh, if, if need be, I'll, I'll go ahead and fix that if, if there's a glare coming in. But um, I'm looking forward to working with everyone and getting to know everyone better. So thank you again, Professor Kennedy, for that introduction. It was very nice. Uh, no, uh, uh, it's just uh, really exciting to, to have you uh, here. And so now, uh, Ingrid, I think um, obviously I'm new at this, so I'm probably going to uh, make some mistakes today as chair. Uh, but Ingrid, I think it's time to uh, call the roll and uh, give the logistics. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Commissioner Bonner? Commissioner Bonner with us today. Commissioner Gigan? Here. Commissioner Heron. Here. Chair Kennedy. Here. Commissioner Rubin. Here and welcome to our news commissioner as well. Welcome, Jamon. Thank you. Commissioner Hicks. Here, present. And I believe that's it for the commission. Okay. Um... I guess we need to begin uh, by just reminding everyone that we do have a code of conduct. Rather than reading the whole script, I just want to uh, remind everyone uh, that we, um, we have time limits, uh, and those time limits are so that everyone gets a chance to speak, or as many people as possible get a chance to speak. And we, uh, we ask everyone, to uh, we can carry on robust discussion and debate, but to be respectful uh, to each other and make our point uh, in, in a way that recognizes we're all members of this community. With that, I think uh, we go to the uh, consent calendar. We need to approve the January 2022 uh, minutes. I'll move approval. And um, I'll second. Thank you. I think that's I think I think that's it, right? <laughs> so our next agenda item is our. Uh, I think you still need to vote on it, Sean. Even though uh, even though we have a motion in the second, we still need to vote on it. Oh, I, I I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> uh, we'll get so uh, can we uh, just have a? Uh, do we have to go one by one, or can we just all? Uh, does anyone object to approving our last uh, uh, meeting's minutes? No. no. Having no objection, I think that uh, uh, they're approved. There you go. And I see that uh, uh, Commissioner Bonner has joined us uh, as well. So we move to uh, <laughs> agenda item number two, reports and uh, possible actions. Uh, so we start with uh, uh, the chair's report. I guess that's me. And uh, 
all I have to uh, report on is that I have met uh, via Zoom with several community groups over the past month who uh, shared their uh, very strong concerns uh, that this commission uh, uh, should have stronger oversight over the sheriff's department. Uh, they feel that the um, idea that the sheriff stands for election once every four years doesn't uh, uh, provide enough oversight. And, and uh, so they're really asking uh, the Board of Supervisor and this commission to look into other ways to make uh, the sheriff's department accountable between elections. And uh, they also express concerns about uh, Sheriff Villanueva's campaign activities, the use of uh, public funds to advance his campaign, his appearances uh, uh, on public radio criticizing other politicians. And all I can say is that we appreciate the input and uh, we are going to look into the concerns that were raised at the meeting and report on them when we have more information uh, as a commission uh, uh, at large. So that's, uh, that's what I have. And now uh, we have the executive director's report. So Brian, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Sean, and good morning, everyone. Welcome, Commissioner Hicks. I want to uh, first just again, thank uh, Professor Ochen who is no longer with us here on our commission for her service uh, over the past uh, really five years. She was a great uh, member of our commission and led our commission over the past year. And again, also, <clears throat> I know commissioner, former commissioner Tolentino was watching us this morning. And so Cass, we thank you for your service and we miss you as, as well. Uh, just really two quick announcements. One is <clears throat> we're moving closer toward uh, meeting in person once again. We take our cue from the uh, board of supervisors, and once they make the decision to begin in-person meetings, we will have to do the same. So staff is working on that, uh, both in terms of a location and what those meeting logistics will look like. It is possible that when we begin our in-person meetings, it will be sort of a hybrid initially, and that is the commissioners will be together, and then we will not have the public in the audience. And then further along, we will add the public to the audience, to the in-person audience as well. So logistically, we're trying to figure out how to do that, uh, how to use technology to make sure that we're able to do that. Uh, we have noted that we've had uh, great participation when we've used this virtual platform. So we're hoping to continue with the virtual platform at some point, as along with having in-person uh, folks in the audience and the commissioners together to uh, have our meetings. And you'll hear more about that as we go along I don't want to steal uh, Commissioner uh, Harris's thunder, uh, but we are going to have a uh, conference on March 24th to talk about the Sheriff's Department's budget. And I know uh, uh, Commissioner Harris is going to talk about that a little bit more in the future. So that concludes my report and uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Brian. And uh, we look forward to uh, a live meetings or a live, uh, I guess a hybrid live and streaming format. Uh, next up is our Inspector General. Max, do you have anything to report? Um, nothing specific. I'll just quickly uh, point out that on our website, you can see our latest reports, some of which have popped up since our last meeting. Uh, we did a review of the National Lawyers Guild press conference that the Sheriff's Department broke up uh, using riot control tactics. We issued that report uh, particularly because the Sheriff's Department made public representations about how they cleaned out uh, this group from a private parking lot at the request of a private entity, and that was false, as we reported in our report. Not surprisingly, the Sheriff's Department, instead of saying, sorry, we provided false information, has doubled down on that and said, uh, well, we got a complaint, we had to do it. So, uh, unfortunately, the trend continues that uh, it appears that uh, public resources are being used for political purposes in the form of propaganda presented by the department when they could be used for uh, complying with Public Records Act requests and other legal duties. So that's an unfortunate uh, continuing trend, uh, as, as was the deployment uh, at the time because it was a First Amendment issue. So, so that report is available for anybody who wants to dig into the details or any questions anybody has. Uh, secondarily, uh, our other second report or 
chronologically moving backwards that's uh, up there now is on family assistance, but we're going to be talking about that later. So I won't say anything about that at this time. And then the last one is our quarterly report, which includes statistics on um, the fact that uh, shootings have gone up consistently throughout this administration, deputy involved shootings, and then also uh, deaths in custody. And there's been some talk about whether or not COVID is the, the controller for that. I addressed the board on this subject and uh, you know we pulled out the numbers to show that yes, indeed, there was a, a number of COVID related deaths, which I believe are attributed to the overcrowding in the jail uh, that was not mitigated sufficiently during the pandemic, but also uh, there's an increase in independent of that. So um, we, we, we've documented that in that report and anybody who has any questions about it, we can address. And then, uh, as you all know, we're working on deputy gangs, investigating them as, as this commission has uh, directed and, and as my duties require. I apologize, I have some dogs here. <laughs> you let them run away. Okay, um, so that's, uh, that's it for me, since my dogs are barking, so I'm going to say goodbye. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, Max. And um, next, we uh, have some ad hoc committee reports. You know, the ad hoc committees are the lifeblood of this commission. And uh, as you know, the budget process is uh, moving its way through the system. And uh, uh, we have Commissioner J.P. Harris, who's going to give us a brief update on the budget uh, ad hoc uh, committee activities. So, J.P., uh, take it away. Thank you, uh, Chairman Kennedy. I just want to start off with, again, thanking uh, Commissioner Tolentino. He was the chair of this um, uh, ad hoc committee uh, and did an incredible job in that capacity. And uh, his departure has left uh, both Commissioner Kennedy and myself to try and pull it together um, with the able assistance of, of staff, Frederick Chung and, um, and Tracy, uh, Tracy Williams. Um, we have put out, uh, our staff has provided a, a, a report which is heavily footnoted and gives, provides the public with a tremendous amount of information that I strongly encourage them to open those footnotes and look at the information. As Executive Director Williams already mentioned, we are going to have, we're going to have a, um, I guess sort of a town hall on Thursday, the 24th, uh, where we can really dig into questions from the public. Uh, we already have confirmation that, um, uh, Conrad Meredith from the Sheriff's Department and Sheila Williams from the CEO will both be in attendance um, to really drill down into some of the questions, pertinent questions that people might have concerning this. I hope the uh, public recognizes and the commission itself recognizes, you know, trying to find the, the spot between defund the police and fund the police and come up with a reasonable approach to ensure that the public is provided with critical public safety, uh, both from uh, sheriff's patrol, but also in custody facilities uh, until such time as other things can be put into place. And perhaps the sheriff's department can cease being the primary provider of mental health services for uh, folks uh, in Los Angeles County. Uh, we need to make sure that those services are provided uh, and it, it truly is a challenge. We know there's a lot of competing ideas and interests, uh, and we will delve into that more on, on Thursday. I, I want to particularly thank um, uh, Director Meredith for his uh, openness and willingness to provide the information to this ad hoc committee. Um, I know there are people who are upset with our current sheriff for a variety of reasons, but I hope that they understand that the staff at the sheriff's department the professional staff in particular and Conrad Meredith and his staff have been working very diligently in the public's interest to try and keep those critical functions uh, working. Uh, that's not to say that there can't be some changes and that's not to say that there aren't some different points of view. I think um, uh, Ms. Williams from the CEO's office will add a, another layer to this discussion that should make it very robust on Thursday. Um, so again, I just really draw your attention to the document, the staff report, and all the footnotes. There's a lot of information in there. 
Um, I'm not going to go into any detail on right now because I think we'll have more time to do that on on Thursday. So with that, I'll I'll conclude my remarks. Thank you, JP. Just to clarify, is next Thursday's town hall is it going to be a virtual event? And I'm sorry. Yes, that is correct. It will be a virtual event, so that makes it much more easy for people to uh, to attend. Okay. Thank you. Um, next, uh, uh, the the topic of deputy gangs at the uh, sheriff's department obviously. Uh, remains in the news. Uh, uh, many opinions uh, on both sides of the issue have been reported on, and the Board of Supervisors has asked this commission in the wake of the RAND report and uh, other reports on uh, the issue of deputy gangs to uh, um, propose a tangible implementation plan for the board to uh, move forward and address the problems associated with uh, deputy gangs or in the nomenclature of the new law, law enforcement gangs. And so we're going to have our ad hoc uh, uh, chair on deputy clicks and, and gangs, Lael Rubin, um, make some remarks. Lael, you've got the floor. Uh, thank you so much, Sean. Um... This is, um, is and has always been um, a, a challenging topic um, and um, one, of the, one of the issues that uh, this commission has been directed to um, respond to has been a request from the board um, making suggestions how to implement um, the uh, uh, the RAND recommendations and others, and um, our chair, Sean Kennedy, has been tasked along with the ad hoc um, committee to um, provide that report to the to the board. And I know that um, the the work continues. Uh, the most recent review of materials, uh, I would say, not received from the sheriff's department has been a request from some time ago to um, receive some information regarding um, statements uh, from uh, a supposed investigation in Compton. And um, that that request once again has been referred to the um, to the sheriff, and I believe as of this morning, we have not had a response. So um, we move forward, and um, I believe the ad hoc committee is going to attempt to meet next Tuesday um, to discuss this and other issues, um, assuming that all participants in the ad hoc um, committee can be present. So with that, the work continues. Thank you, Sean. Oh, thank you, Lael, for uh, all your work on this important issue. I, I, I think um, the community just is is very concerned about uh, deputy gangs in the sheriff's department, obviously. Next on our agenda says a report from the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department to give us an update. Uh, the sheriff's department is always welcome at our meetings. We love to uh, have representatives uh, exchange ideas and uh, discuss the issues. Um, I don't know if we have a representative here to give a report. Chair Kennedy, we did invite uh, Under Sheriff Murakami to the meeting. He indicated that he was unable to make it, but that Assistant Sheriff Corbett would be here. So I know the Assistant Sheriff is online. Not sure if he's prepared to give a report at, at this point, but we'd ask uh, him to pop on and let us know. Morning, everybody. Um, you correct, Mr. Williams. I apologize, uh, commissioners. I was not prepared to report on the department. I was here uh, basically um, to respond to some of the ad hoc on CRDF and some of the um, the things we've done at uh, the female uh, jail down there in response to Miss Belt's uh, report. I think she's going to be presenting. If there's anything you could ask that maybe I could possibly answer. Uh, but as a, a basically a state of the department report, I was not prepared for that, and I apologize. No need for an apology. We we do understand. Does anyone have a question? Or otherwise, I guess we could um, just go through the agenda. And it sounds like there are areas where you you are uh, ready to respond later on in the agenda. Correct, sir. 
Okay, uh, we'll move on then. Obviously, uh, Priscilla Ochen has uh, left us uh, and uh, I am occupying the role of chair until we have elections in June. And that means we don't have a vice chair. And so uh, I want to throw it out there uh, to see whether uh, anyone uh, uh, has uh, would like to nominate someone for uh, the vice chair position right now. Uh, right now, we just that's apt absent. I'm, I guess I'm fulfilling chair and vice chair. And uh, if if someone would like to nominate someone, we could have an election. If today is not the day, we can wait and take this up uh, perhaps at our next meeting, hopefully when we have even more uh, new commissioners. Leo. Yes, thank you, Sean. Um, I think it is um, appropriate to wait at this point. Um, we have um, our newest commissioner, Commissioner Hicks here, and hopefully either the next meeting or the meeting after we will have two additional commissioners um, and um, hopefully soon we will also have the ninth commissioner. So I think um, while it's a tremendous burden on you um, at this point, um, I, I don't think this is an appropriate time um, to have a nomination and election for vice chair. And um, I would urge us to um, wait until we have all of the commissioners present. And um, obviously those of us who are here can assist you if needed. Um, but I would, um, I would move to defer that. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't see anyone else. I, I think that makes sense, Lil. I, uh, for me, it's a, uh, um, a welcome, uh, uh, I'm, I, I welcome kind of filling in uh, on both sides because my friends have run this commission for years and now I have a newfound respect for all of them as they run the, the meetings, it's harder than it looks. So if uh, no one wants to nominate anyone, I think what we'll do is we'll just continue as is until we have more commissioners, because as Leo said, we're expecting more appointments uh, uh, very soon. And I think that would be the best election with all, all, all our new members. Okay, so we move to uh, our next uh, uh, agenda item, uh, and that is family impact remarks. And uh, Jennifer, I think, uh, do, do we have that set up for our uh, families to speak? I think I speak for all the commissioners when I say this is um, some of the most important work we do in these meetings. And so um, let me know how we're gonna do this. Yep, Julie Martinez, you are unmuted now. Uh, you'll have 10 minutes. Uh, so go ahead and begin whenever you are ready, Julie. Thank you. Thank you for inviting families impacted by sheriff deputy violence to speak. In the case of my family, we are impacted by sh by specific sheriff deputy gang violence. In the case of my family, it occurred. Uh, my grandson, Paul Rea, at the age of 18, was in 19, 2019, was killed by a chef, sheriff deputy gang member during a routine traffic stop. This deputy gang member was operating out of the East LA station. This action impacted our family, not just his death, but the harassment that has followed and the harassment that never seems to end, even as recent as a couple weeks ago. In retrospect, what occurred in the neighborhood, which was the shooting of my grandson on the street that he grew up, that shooting was just the beginning. Deputy gangs have been allowed to spread as the sheriff department under Alex Van Weva has created an environment where deputies are free to engage in deputy gang violence. Deputies are free to openly harass families who dare to speak up. Spe and when they speak up, they're speaking up in order to expose the violence and to expose deputy gang activities. For, and, and what they report is firsthand, quite often, 
they have the names and the badge numbers of these deputies. And of course, they have the names and the badge numbers when on the days that the deputy sheriffs do not hide them or cover them with tape. I'm here to talk about the effects of harassment on families and individuals, the layers of trauma that are inflicted in our communities by LA County Sheriff Department. It is difficult to articulate the words when I say Alex Van Wave has gone too far because the bar has been set so very low. We as a community, as a state, as a country should not be surprised by the culture of violence in LA County Sheriff Department. As unfortunately for the community, Alex Van Wave has not curbed violence within LA County Sheriff Department. In fact, as, as the, the data reports, death at the hand of LA Sheriff Department has increased under Van Wave. Further, he regularly displays his disdain for the community. He is tasked and hired to serve, but, in, but he dis continually displays disdain for those who speak out. Villanueva uses his position as sheriff to literally destroy individuals and families who speak out. I'm going to be addressing a very specific press conference in which Villanueva announced at the beginning of the press conference that instead of doing his weekly uh, live uh, Instagram, Facebook, he, he held a press conference. And yes, I'm going to say Villanueva went too far yet again. We in Alley County are regularly subject to this sheriff who defends policies that pose a danger to our communities. On February 23rd, Villanueva hosted a press conference where he devoted half of the event to speaking out about how the claims of deputy harassment on family members of people killed by LASD personnel are false and simply a political attack organized by the LA County Board of Supervisors. I will say family members and individuals, we are independent of the LA County Board of Supervisors. They do not put us up to this. It's with tremendous fear in the safety of the families that have been impacted by Sheriff Van Wava that I'm speaking out today. Sheriff Van Wava doxed the Vargas family and the Rea family at this press conference that I'm referencing. He began by introducing what he claimed are unsubstantiated claims of harassment. As evidence, he referenced that former DA Lacey adjudicated that LASD were cleared of killings and harassment of the Vargas and Reyes family. He characterized the death of both of our family members as violent encounters. And of course he said that they were justified, which we are contesting. Villanueva further claimed that all claims of harassment have come from only two families, the Rea and the Vargas family, both who were murdered by East Los Angeles Sheriff's Station deputies some of those deputies are gang members within East LA. Van Weva yet again is engaging in this dangerous and threatening behavior by utilizing press conferences to destroy the character of the Vargas and Rea families. In doing so, Van Weva is attempting to destroy the character of all families, not just our families, but all families who come forward to expose the violence of LASD. In this press conference, he introduced pending civil complaints of harassment. Of course, these harassment complaints were initiated by families and individuals and explained these complaints away by claiming that the LASD investigated and deemed the complaints unfounded. I have to ask you as a board, as a commission, how is an internal investigation within the sheriff department ever going to yield a true investigation? How will it ever yield an investigation where his deputies are ever found at fault. Sadly, this 10 minutes, I cannot go into detail of what these investigations and air quotes really exist because they really are poor investigations and they're very manipulated. Last year, there was an incident where Deputy Saavedra, a bandido gang prospect from East LA and Deputy Santos, these two deputies are responsible for Paul Ray's death, my grandson. In this particular incident, a Deputy Saavedra taunted and mocked 
Leah, the mother of Paul, and Janae, a minor, at an East LA food truck in East LA. Deputy Savage clearly recognized my family there who were going there for food, and he made an inflammatory comment and created this encounter, which created the, the situation. Sheriff Ian Weva at a press conference utilized a manipulated and highly edited footage that was shared at this press conference, which showed Leah and Janae Minor showed their reactions towards Deputy Savage's taunting. Leah and Janae are on video clearly upset, loudly and boldly exposing both Deputy Savage and, and Santos and the community president present at the res restaurant. Leah and Janae exposed these two officers as a killer of, of Paul, and they did it very publicly. The audio was shared at this press conference, and it does show Janae, who's a minor, shows clearly shows their face. Unfortunately, Villanueva did not did not admit all of the video, and he admitted at the press conference that some of the audio was missing. And unfortunately, this was what was presented to the media in both English and Spanish. The names, their names were clearly spoken out. I believe in this particular case, Villanueva made false statements. And he also at this press conference did not present any facts. He claimed evidence that my family purpose, uh, purposely followed the deputies to the food truck. This food truck area is within their community, the community that the children go to school, that, that the family works and lives. He claimed, he implied that my family were the aggressors and he implied that the deputies were victims by claiming that my fa my family and following them to the food truck he never supplied any evidence of proof of allegations he turned the table and created a situation where it looked like his deputies were the victims he repeatedly refers to the two families the vargas and the reyes family as originators of all complaints Van Weva claims that no other families have made other any allegations other than the Rea and the Vargas family. He claimed that all harassments were alleged. He claimed body footage does not exist to prove, prove, prove harassment claims. And we know that many of these allegations occurred prior to Alice ASD deployment of body cameras. We know that people have been complaining in the community, individuals and family members and witnesses for decades. Both Vargas and Rhea family have bra bravely spoken out in multiple venues, whether it be radio, television interviews, articles, both families were docs that day. Villanueva composed this press conference on the topic of harassment, that a harassment of families impacted by violence. I fear for the safety of both families. I feared for the safety of both families before this press conference. Our family has already moved several times because it gets really annoying and frightening to have sheriff deputies parked outside of your, your home. My advice to families is to be very careful and, and to be very vigilant, write down names, take videos. I cannot stress to you, the commission, how unsafe it is for the Vargas and family them, families because of the fear of harassment and violence. Most damaging, he played footage that exposed Leah and Janae's image to further harassment by the entire East LA station. There's been a very dangerous trend that I've been watching as I do attempt to attend and listen in in many of the town halls that be in Weva. He has attracted a new group of very vocal supporters. Some of these groups have been identified as the FBI as being coming from white uh, supremacist groups and being extremely dangerous. Families have reported been followed, not just by sheriffs and sheriff deputies, by people in plain clothes. And some of these people that have followed them have addressed people. They know intimate details of what has happened with sheriff violence. So we know that it's a very concerted effort to harass these families. Contrary to Vian Weva's claims, there is an overwhelming evidence that LASD deputies regularly harass family members of people who they have killed, especially family members who continue to publicly advocate for justice for their loved ones. 
As we know, many families across the county have been harassed after, directly after they have spoken out. For example, family members of uh, Ryan Twyman, who was killed by deputies from the Century LASD station. Also, AJ Weber, who was killed by deputies from South Los Angeles LASD station, and many more that I do not have time to, unfortunately, I do not have time to address all their names. All of them have reported that LASD deputies regularly harass them at homes, jobs, and especially at memorial services and the memorial sites where their loved ones were killed. And Julie, I hate to interrupt, but 10 minutes have passed. So if you could conclude your remarks, we will move on to the next family. Okay. okay. Th Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you for this opportunity. But what can be done? More importantly, the COC should recommend the board place on the ballot a charter amendment that would create an important impeachment and removal process to provide common sense checks and balances over Villanueva and future sheriffs. We need to reinforce its policy making authority over the sheriff department and strengthen your civilian oversight. The threat of removal would provide the board with a direct mechanism to protect the public from serious violations of the public trust, including serious crimes, unconstitutional conduct and abuse of power. It is extremely important that the COC work with the community members to get an LA County ch uh, Charter Amendment. Which would, which would ensure that future boards actually have critical oversight over the Alley County Sheriff Department. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing um, for sharing your family's uh, story. I, I'm so sorry about uh, Paul and all that you have gone through, and um, we really appreciate you um, telling us. Uh, what's going on out there uh, because, you know, our intent is to stop that and help make it better. So, thank you. We have, uh, we did not have a, a public meeting last month because we were busy selecting, um, uh, trying to select new commissioners. So, I thought it was appropriate to have uh, a second family member who asked to speak, uh, speak as well. So, Jennifer, don't we have Helen Jones as well? We do, yes. And uh, Helen, I will be unmuting you right now. And you have you, 10 Jennifer. minutes, Helen, uh, whenever you would like to begin. Um, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, good morning, commissioners. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Helen Jones. I am the mother of John Horton. I am a community organizer with Dignity and Power Now. On the 30th of this month would be the 13th year of my son, John Horton, beating death, which was staged to look like a suicide by 10, 3,000 boys, deputy sheriff gang members, just a few names, Cliff Yates, William Pinhollow, Christopher Kidder, and others, and the notorious De um, deputy Mark Romero, also admitted to beating my son, John, with his flashlight um, during his video deposition. And Mark Romero also admitted to being accused of using excessive force in two prior lawsuits before the beating death of my son, John Horton. And one of his victims was so afraid of sheriff retaliation that he waited until he was transferred to prison to file his complaint and his lawsuit. And during the time of Mark Romero's deposition, he was in the process of becoming a sheriff detective, which is a shame. He was allowed to do that after being accused of three excessive force beatings. The notorious criminal Lee Baca admitted on camera that there were gangs and then lied and tried to retract his statement. Even when we have proof and can show the pattern of excessive abuse, um, for share, share of gang style execution, shooting, there is no accountability. This is modern day genocide that the sheriff department is committing um, on black and brown communities, members and families. Even when their own deputies report the crime, criminal acts that the sheriff deputies commit on other deputies, they are not believed either. 
This commission and the Board of Supervisors know the retaliation of the sheriff firsthand. And all of us together been watching the sheriff department break every rule, policy, and law as people are continuing to die and and get murdered by the hands of the sheriff department and by the hands of the sheriff gang. If this commission will look into, um, if this commission will look into the old cases and the new cases and examine the crimes that they have committed and the pattern of abuse especially those on the Brady list. If this commission will look into the old cases and these new cases, you could find a lot of um, names of the um, deputy gang members because you can tell by the way that they murdered our family members. You can see the pattern of the excessive force, the excessive shootings that they are doing um, to our community members. You can also get a lot of information from us, the families, that are going through this, the, us that are, we the ones that are, you know, in pain and um, we can give you this information, these names through our cases, because we have the autopsy report. We have these depositions on these deputies that y'all will never be privy to. So if this commission and the board of supervisors will really meet with the families and see what we have to say and look into our, our cases, you will find so many names of these different gang members from these different um, sheriff's um, stations, and you will know who you're dealing with. So I just say, um, I just really appreciate um, being able to speak today. I really b wish that this commission would really listen to the family and the community members because we know we know what deputies are doing what. We know what deputies are committing the crime. We know what deputies are retaliating against our family members. But the sad part about it, nobody is listening to us. Nobody is hearing us. And because a lot can be, a lot more can be done about this. And um, I'll just stop there. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Helen. I, I I can hear uh, how much you've gone through in the past 13 years, and I'm so sorry. It's our intention to listen to you. And so um, uh, the reason we have these comments is uh, we really want to make it better for families who have gone through what you and your family have gone through. Thank you. We will uh, take public comments on the remarks that we just heard from the two families uh, later on. Right now, we are going to uh, move to our next agenda item, which relates to something that was discussed at our last COC meeting, and that is the conditions for um, uh, women of color who are housed at the Century Regional Detention Facility, CRDF. Uh, we brought this up uh, briefly at our last meeting, and we thought that it was appropriate to uh, have it addressed fully at this meeting. And to that end, we have our uh, Assistant Inspector General, Katie Belts here, as well as uh, Assistant Sheriff Corbett to talk to us. So, um, Katie, I'm going to have you start us off, and thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate you coming in to tell us what's going on in our jails. Of course. Good morning. Thank you so much, Chair and Commissioners. It's good to be here. Thanks for for having us. Um, I, I was asked to talk briefly about our most recent quarterly report uh, and offer any updates on, uh, as the Chair mentioned, the care and conditions of confinement for people at CRDF, including um, pregnant people, and um, also to address allegations of racial bias and access to programming opportunities at that facility. Uh, so I'll do my best to be brief. You can read more about these issues in our in our most recent quarterly report, as Max mentioned, uh, that is on our website. So uh, regarding allegations of racial bias and programming, uh, COVID has uh, 
extensively limited access to programming system-wide um, and, and also at CRDF as well. But nonetheless, they are still offering uh, educational, vocational, and they're resuming and, and increasing offerings now, um, but they're still offering educational, uh, vocational, and then drug and alcohol uh, treatment-related programming opportunities for folks at CRDF. But last uh, November, some of my staff and I met with uh, COC, then Chair Priscilla O'Chen and Civil Brand Commission uh, Chair Cheryl Grills, and we learned of, uh, of disturbing allegations, which, which frankly support allegations that we've received periodically over the years, that uh, people in custody uh, at CRDF were being deprived of specific participation in credit earning, so time credit earning programming opportunities on the basis of race and ethnicity. Uh, so thereafter, and, and utilizing the Sheriff's Department racial and ethnic categorizations, including uh, black, Hispanic, white, and other, monitor Megan Brownlee of our office conducted a preliminary analysis. She requested some data and uh, and her preliminary findings reveal that indeed African American people in custody at CRDF appear to be underrepresented in programming opportunities. Um, it also suggests that people in custody identifying uh, as as identified in the other racial and ethnic category were equitably represented in programming opportunities, and that uh, whites and Latinx uh, people in custody at CRDF are overrepresented in programming opportunities. There, there were some limitations to our data, so we don't yet have a completely valid data set, and until we do, we won't be able to report uh, more definitively to you and with, with any greater degree of specificity our findings, but we uh, have a solid working hypothesis that, in fact, there is um, there. It, there is disproportionality and representation based on race and ethnicity and in, in credit earning programming opportunities. And I mean, I'm happy if you have questions, I can go into more detail in terms of the uh, limitations on data. I will say this, that um, if we eventually, do, we're working with the department to get a complete and valid data set. And, and you know, most importantly, we have to identify that uh, to the extent to which the uh, underrepresentation is confirmed uh, that any of the variables that may be impacting that disproportionality uh, in representation, uh, you know, we've just got to identify them. So if, for example, security classification or criminal charges are uh, impacting one's eligibility for enrollment in programming, um, perhaps there may be um, other issues related to institutional behavior or discipline. Uh, so it's it's just going to be incredibly important to understand what factors are impacting programming opportunities in order to be able to fix them. And so we are working closely with the department. I mean, the custody executives have, have firmly committed to, to rectifying this problem and, and to, to really putting in place systems that allow not only for equity and representation, but really meaningful and, and positive opportunities for African-Americans uh, to earn both time credits and also any benefits from, from substantive programs. Uh, just, and, and I can talk a little bit more about that in, in a minute if necessary, but but I want to just make sure that we cover quickly this, this idea of the complaints that we're receiving about poor experiences of pregnant people in custody at CRDF. So we, we've been reporting on this issue for quite some time. So we initially published a report in 2018 on, on care of and conditions of confinements for uh, pregnant people at CRDF. And, you know, we've really continued to monitor the conditions for that incredibly vulnerable population since then. Uh, unfortunately, more recently, we've started to receive additional complaints on some of those same issues that we reported on back in 2018. And some of these complaints we received directly, and then some of them came through uh, really important work that the Civil Brand Commission is doing as well. So uh, I'll, Again, you can review it in more detail, but there are just three sort of primary areas of, of complaints that we've been receiving. Um, and, and I want to offer some updates on, on some corrective action that's been taking that I think is, is positive. Uh, so, number one, we receive complaints about insufficient access to bottled or filtered water by pregnant people in custody. We recommended, obviously, the provision of additional bottled water consistent with the recommended daily water consumption for pregnant people. And so in response, and in, in, in quick response, uh, the Sheriff's Department increased the amount of bottled water offered from four bottles to six, 
which actually exceeds the higher end of that recommended daily water consumption range. So that's positive. Also, um, very positive. Uh, the department reports that they're going to be installing Brita faucet filters in each of the housing modules. Uh, I, I'm still unclear on whether it's only going to be in housing modules where pregnant people are. Um, or if it's going to be in all of the housing modules, but I will say that this is really important, not only for pregnant people in custody, but for everybody in custody at CRDF. I mean, the water's tested, it's, uh, it's tested regularly and it's deemed safe, but it doesn't taste good. And then, you know, compounded by issues that they've had with um, drain fly infestations, which they also regularly monitor and, and control for, um, the, the water just isn't appealing, and so installing filters is actually is, is really a great step, and so we just want to thank the department for doing that. We also received complaints about uh, inadequate prenatal diet, so more general complaints that food is cold so that they aren't receiving hot meals, and this commission has also um, heard of those complaints as well in the past, but also more specifically that people who are pregnant aren't being prescribed prenatal diets in a timely way upon entry to the facility. Um, and also that, for example, diets aren't, aren't really nutritionally balanced so that they may be receiving up to six slices of bread each day, which, which may be uh, too much of a carbohydrate uh, consumption for, for people who are pregnant. So we recommended that the department reevaluate uh, the prenatal diets that they're offering, as they have done in the past, but we ask that they, that they reevaluate the diets overall um, and that they offer more fresh fruits and vegetables, um, and then specifically also just obviously not include so much bread as, um, you know, filler to meet daily caloric requirements or, or goals. So the department did report that COVID supply chain issues were impacting their ability to, to offer them as nutrition balanced meals as they would want and that they were required to make uh, what they referred to as less nutritional substitutions at times, not only the, to the prenatal diets, but to diets generally. Um, those issues have now reportedly been resolved. Uh, they also indicate that staffing shortages are an ongoing issue, which continue to impact the provision of hot meals, not only at CRDF, but at, throughout the system. So that remains an issue. Um, we were really encouraged to learn that the department really quickly has has completely reevaluated the prenatal diets and has drafted all new prenatal diets, which I think are currently in the review process by CHS and are expected to be piloted, I believe, on March 20th, but the assistant sheriff can confirm that for us. Uh, these diets are, are going to include more fresh fruits and vegetables. So from what I understand, at least four servings daily, and then they're going to have at least three separate prenatal diets in addition to the vegetarian, kosher, and halal diets that they offer, although there is no vegan diet, but, but the specific prenatal diets will be designed. There will be one diet for people in the first trimester, one diet for those in the second and third trimester, and then a, a third diet for those who've been diagnosed with uh, gestational diabetes. So that's incredibly encouraging. Um, Perhaps the biggest and, and most sort of pervasive uh, ongoing and concerning complaint that we received, um, it's something that's been, it's just been an issue in the, you know, going on eight years that I've been here is uh, that there is a lack of opportunities for out of cell time. So people just don't get out enough, basically. We know that this is particularly problematic for pregnant people, but it's, um, it is a huge issue. It comes up frequently. Uh, during critical incident reviews, we have recommended time and again that the sheriff's department ensure closer monitoring of these issues and, and better accountability mechanisms for failure to offer adequate out of cell time. And it's especially problematic for women and and particularly for pregnant women. So, so the Department of Health recommends, I think it's around 150 minutes or so of moderate aerobic exercise every week for people who are pregnant as well as uh, uh, postpartum individuals. Uh, the department records that we initially looked at and reported on in our quarterly from September 1 to November 30 uh, suggest that the average out of cell time offered at CRDF uh, in the modules where pregnant people were housed was 205 minutes a week. So that is, is just not going to be adequate um, for the recommended uh, weekly aerobic exercise that's afforded to pregnant people because during that time they have to shower. It's their only opportunity to shower, to order commissary, to talk on the phone, to exchange linens. Um, 
and, and you know, to socialize and, and be outside of their cells. We also aren't sure if the time that was documented also reflects that those folks who were out of their cell were allowed in what is referred to as the outdoor rec area, which is a larger area where people can um, maybe engage more freely in aerobic exercise than they can in the in the general rec area right outside of cells. So, you know, we we again we've we've just recommended that not only for the pregnant population but facility wide better monitoring of these issues and and better accountability mechanisms to ensure that people are 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 disciplined for failure to provide out of cell time. And if you know it may be that they're offering out of cell time but they're not documented properly in their in their EUDAL system, which is the electronic uniform daily activity log. Um, so as we know that if it if it wasn't adequately documented, then they they won't receive credit for having allowed people out. So failure to document is something that we've also recommended um, better accountability and mechanisms for. We have not to date seen um, anybody be written up or disciplined for failure to offer out of cell time. Um, and we have received a variety of, of explanations for why that is the case. Um, and perhaps the assistant sheriff can, can go into it more deeply, but our point is you just simply can't confine people and not them allow, be allow, allow them outside of their cells for large muscle exercise. Uh, it is it is not humane. So um, also on an encouraging note, I just spoke to the assistant sheriff about this last night and he indicated that he's, he's wanting to, as he described it, reimagine what out of cell time looks like at CRDF so he can talk about that in a second. I'll just quickly say then in closing, um, you know, Melissa Kelly, so Melissa Kelly is somebody um, that executives were incredibly smart to put in place. So she's a civilian and she is a director of EBI and, and she's also directing the department's efforts toward implementing gender responsiveness at CRDF. Um, she's sort of at, she's a civilian, but at sort of what I think is a commander rank. So um, she's, she's absolutely amazing and deeply committed to resolving all of the issues at CRDF, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> that she's responsible for. And so we're grateful to be able to work with her. She's helping us identify some of these issues. And as I said, she's she's committed to fixing it. So are the executives. Um, but you know, implementing gender responsiveness is is just an uphill battle. And so for whatever the best efforts on the part of executives and on, on the part of Melissa Kelly, um, unless and until we see <clears throat> a shift. And, and an understanding of really a cultural shift facility wide that reflects a deep understanding of and commitment to the acknowledgement that people that women and people housed in what are traditionally women's facilities are not men. They do not and should not. Uh, they don't need to be treated and should not be treated like men. They don't need to be security classified in the same way that men are. Um, they don't need to be disciplined. In the same way that men are, and, and and until we put systems in place in this jail that um, you know policies, protocols, practices, and and accountability mechanisms that reflect an understanding of that truth, I fear that any you know gender responsive efforts will not be successful. Um, so on that perhaps less than optimistic note. Um, there is there is some optimism that I hope will come out in further discussion, but I'm happy to take any questions. Should we um, hear from the assistant sheriff, and then we'll take questions. Um, uh, Katie, you you used an acronym, I think, when you're talking about Melissa's work, EBI, or could you could you explain that for us? In case sure. People don't know. Sure. EBI stands for education based incarceration and so that is the the educational programming that's offered in in the system and the assistant sheriff can talk more about its evolution but they it's actually an incredible program that they've worked really hard to implement based on models um, out of San Francisco and other jurisdictions that have that have implemented uh, EBI programs I appreciate it. Every time I go to the jail, there's a lot of slang I don't understand, Katie. So uh, thanks for. Sorry for uh, using it. <laughs> no, no. I think you're. Uh, it's great that you're here to educate us all. Assistant Sheriff, uh, do you have any remarks you want to uh, make as well? Um, well, first, I want to thank um, the commissioners for having me here, and I want to thank Katie for acknowledging Melissa. Um, she is an all-star. Melissa Kelly is the uh, the tip of the spear for us. With our GRAC, with uh, which is the gender responsiveness, our EBI, the education-based. Um, I almost don't know where to start. That was a lot Katie presented. Um, 
let let me try to just drill down a little on on what she was what she uh, is speaking about and and I want to thank Commissioner Harris. Uh, we had a really productive meeting with him and Cheryl Grills on some of the data that they were talking about that that made the appearance of um, of possible racism. Uh, we're taking that very serious. Um, like anything else, when you look at raw data, you need to look at all the uh, the nuances. So we're doing that. Um, if we are having programming that isn't um, productive for African American women, then we need to change it. If we're if we're not presenting it in a way to encourage them, we need to change it. Uh, we went as far as uh, uh, recommending, and that Chief uh, Velasquez recommended um, Dr. Grills or any re representative to do a video and to encourage um, African American persons in our care to uh, enroll in programming. Uh, if there are security classifications or things that are prohibiting them from being uh, workers or going to uh, programming, we're going to relook at that. Um, so we're, we're taking the opportunity to to shift the focus and see if we can make it more workable for them. Um, you know, I, one of the things the sheriff brought into uh, to us was uh, Dr. Ruben Guerra, uh, the Latino Business Association is going to come in and even though it says Latino in the name, but it's for all of our persons in our care for entrepreneur. I can't even say it entrepreneur. Great can't say it um, training so they can do uh, small businesses um, and get licensed and contract and it, it's very and they're going to provide the computers for this again, like Katie mentioned, COVID did hamper our efforts a little. It, it put us back on allowing. Um, the programming to go and having the vendors come in and the teachers and that, but we're, we're trying to get a full court press to get that back. Um, and we'll work with the uh, civil brand and the, the yourself and, and commissioner Harris and Katie to, to make sure we're doing that. But, um, we got Melissa and chief Velasquez and, and captain Montoya down there. We're fully aware of this and, and we're going to do what we can to, to. If there is anything to that, to, to rectify it and make it better and more um, open to everybody. Um, as far as the water and the, and the, the pregnant diets, uh, Katie hit a lot on that. Um, we did have the water tested recently uh, after Mr. Huntsman, I think mentioned the concerns with water in one of the previous meetings. Department of Public Health gave a green light for all the water at Towers, Men's Central Jail and CRDF. Um, so we're still gonna move forward with the filtered water. Um, we're, we're looking to see if we can install that. It wouldn't be so much feasible at each cell. I think they would be a little cost prohibitive, uh, but we could do it in common areas to where they could have bottles and fill it up. Um, I talked to Dr. Henderson personally about, is there too much water for a pregnant person? Could they overhydrate? He said, absolutely not. Give them as much as they want. So that's our mantra. Katie mentioned six bottles. If they ask for eight, they get eight. If they ask for 10, they get 10. We're not going to limit it to six. That's hopefully the minimum we give them. Um, on top of the, the prenatal diet she mentioned, we're also having our nutritionists go down and give nutrition training. Because it's one thing to give them the diet, but if they eat 10 Snickers bars, it's kind of counterproductive. So we want to coach them then also in how to eat properly, how to maintain their diets and all that. So I think that'll help. And the nice thing is our nutritionist has an intern program from some local colleges that they will also come in so we'll have an ongoing constant uh, ability to coach and, and work with them on their nutrition. Um, I'm trying to follow Katie's bullet point. She went down. Um, out of cell time, a concern and a very, there's a lot of reasons it's, it's not tracked properly. If somebody has, uh, if they're out of cell time and then they have uh, a doctor appointment or whatever, that overrides their time. So it's clunky on how we track it. So what I want to do is a paradigm shift and I've talked to my chiefs and I've talked to Captain Montoya. I want to call it in cell time. So they only have to be in their cell at certain times. They could be out. The norm will be for them to be out. The restriction will be if there are certain instances they have to be in. We're going to turn it around. So if this count time or maybe pill call or something, they got to go in their cell. The rest of the time they're out. So we're going to change the paradigm here to reverse it. And hopefully it, 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 it'll make it easier to track and actually go towards where we want them to get out of their cells. Now, there's some security concerns, obviously, and classifications, but we'll look at how we can do that. But if we can 
go more to a direct supervision model where they're out all the time and then they only have to go in for certain things, it'll benefit everybody. And um, food services, going back to what the special diets and that, uh, I don't want to get on a soapbox here, but we are 36 to 38 percent reduction in our food service capacity of our, our employees. Uh, we've taken a pretty big hit on that. We're working with uh, the CEO to unfreeze the ability to hire our food service workers. Um, remember, we have two to 3,000 special diets three times a day. Um, so sometimes there is a, a little bit of a backlog, but we're working on it. Um, we're, we're looking at other options, but we know that the prenatal and the medical and all that is a priority. Uh, Dr. Henderson is constantly reviewing um, I think Katie mentioned the first trimester. He seemed to think there was too much sugar in one of the cheese or milk. So they're looking at that. So constantly under review now. And we, we go off the direction of uh, correctional health services for that. Um, I think we pretty much hit a lot of it. Uh, I want to again thank Commissioner Harris for working with us on that meeting with, with uh, Cheryl Grills. I think we addressed a lot of things moving forward that we, we can get ahead of. Um, and I, I could just answer any other questions. Thank you so much, uh, Assistant Sheriff Corbett. And I, I think the, the thing to do now is open it up for uh, questions and discussions from uh, commissioners. Uh, Leo, I see your hand up. Thank you. Um, thank you, Katie. It's always good to hear from you. and. Uh, Thank you, um, Assistant Sheriff Corbett. Um, I would like a little more information about um, Melissa Kelly, um, how long she has been um, employed and what, how do you use her? Um, and can she be used on a broader basis? Um, number one, number two is, um, <clears throat> What is the current number of pregnant people at CDRF? And has there been any attempt to um, um, release them um, to community programs rather than keeping them at CDRF? So I've kind of asked two questions and um, either one of you or both of you um, hopefully can respond. Thank you. Well, I, I could I can lead with that, Commissioner. Thank you, Melissa Kelly. Um, I will get you her her background on, and we have expanded her role as she's been down there. As a matter of fact, the American Jail Association um, presented the Sheriff's Department in a particular CRDF last year with an award for their response to COVID, and that was 100% what Dr. Kelly did down there and and her her actions. So the sheriff accepted it, but Dr. Kelly, Melissa Kelly went with her to accept that. Um, I will get you her background and, and what she can do. And traditionally, as we mentioned, EBI, the Education Based Incarceration, is under the Inmate Services Bureau. But we're, I'm going to break that out and try to put that directly under uh, Melissa Kelly. That's what she, that's her background, education. And so I think she would do a better job of expanding that and um, going forward, but we'll, I'll, I'll get the commission her uh, her resume, for lack of a better term, and how long she's been with us, but I don't want to let her go, so nobody can shop for her. Uh, and then the second question, I'm, I'm sorry, Commissioner, was um, the this, female. Uh, yes. Okay. So for about a year now, and we've been working with uh, Valencia Boyd and Katie on this, our Inmate Reception Center um, Population Management Bureau has been tracking and working to place, we've been doing this for a long time, uh, pregnant females based on uh, CBOs in the community. Some of it was um, our depopulation efforts, unfortunately left us with the, in the persons in our care with more serious crimes, charges. And so some of the CBOs were not able to accept them on that. And then again, the CBOs were affected by COVID. So they were, they were, limited in their bed space. We re weekly review everybody in our, our system that's pregnant. Remember, CHS, Correctional Health Services, identifies who's pregnant and not, and at what term and, and all that. So we go off of their list, we review it, um, and let's say, for example, somebody one week because of their charge was not um, uh, accepted at a CBO, 
they may have gone to court and the charge reduced. So we review that weekly. We look weekly to try to get them placed. So we've been successful in some. I think there was one in December that Katie brought to our attention that we had missed the charge and we were able to get her placed. Um, this is an ongoing effort we do with uh, Captain Garcia at IRC and Lieutenant Escobedo. They're very involved. They've been doing it a long time and, and we work with a lot of partners in the community to get them placed when we can. And what are the, um, <clears throat> what's the current number of pregnant people? I would have to get that for you, Commissioner. I don't know. Last week it was, I think, 13, but then it went back up to 20. It, it fluctuates weekly. I could get that to you by the end of the meeting, though. I'll, I'll have somebody reach out now. Patty? Patty? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, the the uh, the meet we had two meetings ago is when we uh, this issue was uh, front and center. What was going on with um, pregnant people? And uh, I I just want to say, first of all, I want to say to uh, Assistant Sheriff Corbett, I so appreciate your non defensiveness and that you're um, not just looking at band aids, but you're looking at the systems behind that you're just putting band aids on issues, but on these issues that are very important. Um, but that you are looking at the systems and the structure uh, that does create these these situations that we are all you know concerned about. So I really want to appreciate that. And um, and I'm just very um, I'm just really heartened this because this is what this is what where the inspector general's work is, you know, um, greatly needed and uh, obviously has impact. This is the work of the COC. And so this is the kind of work that we're hoping to do as we move forward, um, bringing on our new commissioners to really be an asset to the, to the life experiences that people have who are in the system. Um, and uh, it's a big responsibility when you incarcerate someone, as you know, you know, it's a big, you, you, you take over somebody's life then you have the responsibility for that person's life while they are in your custody. Um, and so I just feel like from the two months ago when we talked about uh, this issue, so grateful that uh, Katie's back and that the inspector general's office is on it and that you're all working together with the civil brand and then this Dr. Kelly that you're talking about. So I don't know, I just, I wanna feel a little positive today and thank you so much. Thank you, Patty. Um, JP, I think you also wanted to either ask a question or engage. Thank you. Um, not so much ask a question, but I just also want to jump on the uh, Dr. Kelly bandwagon. Um, she's very impressive. She's very dedicated to what she's doing. Um, I met with her down at CRDF uh, I don't know, six weeks ago and had, a, had another one, another tour down there, and she's very open. Um, I guess my, my only comment would be, I know the sheriff's department is always does an excellent job of giving its a players more work. And I, I see where this is going. So I would hope that as you give her additional responsibility, you will give her some additional help to, to accomplish the goals that she is trying to accomplish. I know she's, she, you know, she'll give everything she's got. Uh, she's really dedicated to to the uh, incarcerated women down there, CRDF, uh, as well as to the to the deputies and custody assistants. I mean, it's there's a lot of folks down there that have a lot at stake here, and she is truly dedicated. So I just I will throw out an additional uh, kudos to her. But I, uh, I also ask the business and sheriff, don't if you're going to load her up, give, you know, try and give her some help. And I know that these are uh, big uh, big requests. I also am really glad that. Um, uh, Inspector General uh, Belts is back with us and I uh, look forward to doing some more tours with her. She is also um, really a bright star because she has the ability to interact with the inmates. I've seen how she does it. She, she's very sensitive to the needs of the inmates uh, as well as staff. Um, and I think she's very objective. Um, clearly, we all know custody is, is a huge part of the sheriff's operation. It's one of the most important operations in the department. And it's very complicated in dealing with uh, the various individuals and both the incarcerated and, and the staff is extremely difficult and she does an excellent job. And I'll also just say, I do appreciate you assistant sheriff Corbett, um, your openness 
to talking with us, sharing, you know, you knowledge, uh, the shortcomings, and but we always know when you say you're going to do something, you do it. And if you can't, you tell us why. And I just really appreciate that. The fact you're here today, um, quite frankly, we probably should be talking about custody at each and every one of our um, commission meetings because it is always an important, important topic. You may not, you may not appreciate that open invitation, but I would certainly make it because there's always something to talk about in custody. But we appreciate what you and your staff do uh, to accomplish a very, very difficult job. So thank you for that. No, I, I appreciate that, Commissioner. And um, eleven pregnant females in our care right now. So that's encouraging and one down. That's a good. That's good news. But I appreciate the kind words. And and that's all because of the uh, the heroic actions uh, of our staff this last two years under COVID, uh, working on pretty tough conditions, um, a lot of hours. You know, we we've had the budget curtailments and the staffing shortages, and they've just done a, a magnificent job. And that's you know, it's it's humbling to be there to be here and represent them. But thank you. And no, I don't want to talk about custody every week. <laughs> Uh, Leo, you have another question. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, I just want to um, raise the issue with you, Sean, and um, with our executive director. I think we would all learn a great deal if we um, had Melissa Kelly um, come to the COC and um, give a brief overview as to who she is and what she's doing and how we can assist. I think that that would be um, a future suggestion, so thank you. What a great idea, Brian. Can we make that happen? Sure, I, well, we can make that happen. Uh, Assistant Sheriff Corbett, can we make that happen? Yes, yeah, sir, I, I, I don't think Melissa would have uh, concerns about that, but I'd have to ask her, obviously. Thank you, we'll try to schedule that for I, the I next think, meeting. I, I think you'll be as impressed as we are, so I, I'd like to share that experience with everyone, yes. Thank you. Uh, much appreciated, Assistant Sheriff Corbett. I um, I just have a question that isn't really related to um, TRDF, but it relates to custody. And since we have two people here who really know uh, that world, I wanted to take advantage of it. Um, you know, there's a history of people in custody who feel that they're targeted by deputies affiliated in, you know, deputy gangs or law enforcement gangs or groups, whatever the whatever the nomenclature. And um, we heard obviously from Helen Jones, her concerns about that. Of late, I, I have to say, I've gotten several communications from members of the public that they feel that there's a resurgence of these groups in the jail facilities. And as we heard from, um, as we heard from one of our fire speakers, they fear internal investigations aren't real. So uh, uh, I wanted to ask the, our, our, you know, Katie, um, if someone feels that their loved one is being targeted or abused by a group in custody, um, who can they go to? Because, you know, they can come to me, but I don't have any access to the jail. I don't have any ability to do that. And that's true of the other commissioners who probably receive these. Uh, so for anyone who's feeling targeted, either by what they believe is um, sort of click deputy clicks in, in custody or um, or any personnel individually or otherwise, um, they, they can and should obviously, uh, if they're comfortable and willing, go to the sheriff's department. Um, but I would also I think they are Katie. And I don't think they're they're absolutely understand, um, but they should, and they can also come to us. So it's important that they be able to come to the civilian oversight commission. I mean, that's, that's a really, and, and, and you in particular, who is focusing on that issue specifically, but we're also happy to do what we can to assist. I will say that we don't, um, uh, independently investigate individual complaints. And so the conversations that we end up having with. With complainants uh, typically revolve around trying to get additional information, um, potentially some very initial sort of corroborating information that we then um, would likely tend to bring to the sheriff's department for investigation. We then monitor, we oversee the sheriff's investigations into these allegations. 
Um, I, I will also say that oftentimes when we get involved on the front end, um, and, and we absolutely maintain confidentiality of any complainant to the extent that, that, that they are fearful um, or afraid. But if there are needs that they, immediate needs that they have that, for example, aren't being met, sometimes feeling targeted or retaliated against can be a little bit more difficult to identify and, and fix. But if they have needs that aren't being met, we can sometimes be really successful on the front end without necessarily even uh, identifying who they are. Um, we sometimes also our presence on a row, for example, um, when we receive allegations that deputies are engaging in, in inappropriate behavior in a concerted way, um, can just sort of puts folks on notice that that we're present and watching, and sometimes that that can correct issues. I will say that that um, we think that we should should be reporting these issues to the sheriff's department whenever possible, and and we have accountability mechanisms that exist and we want to support them in using them um, and so doing proper investigations. So um, that, that may be the, a less than satisfying response, especially for those who are fearful, but, but I would absolutely encourage anyone who's experiencing that to reach out to us as well and for you to reach out to us as well. Mm -hmm. So the individual, we, we can go to the inspector general's office or, or is there, I mean, I'm, I'm just really looking for practicalities because people, uh, they express these concerns and they make it clear that they don't think they can go to the sheriff's department. They should go to your unit or is there a particular way they do this? Yeah, they can, they can call us. So the way people contact us is by, you know, obviously when we're, when we're in facilities, people flag us down there. There aren't many of us for the, for a really large population. So that can sometimes not be effective or feel satisfying for people. They can contact our office um, via phone. Uh, we often have, obviously they can write to us as well. We are sometimes contacted through their uh, calls that are made to the ACLU. So that's another way to reach us. You can uh, have family members file and not totally anonymous complaints on our website. Um, or we also receive complaints. Family members call our offices and, and speak to us directly and, and can also then file confidential complaints that way as well. Um, we, we meet with people, uh, we meet with family members in locations that that family members identify as feeling safe for them. So, you know, I've done that multiple times. Uh, Staff and I have done that. We also, um, sometimes people who want to speak to us, you know, we try and pull out people sort of at random. So rather than speaking to them at cell front, which cannot feel safe and secure to have a confidential conversation, we pull people out into um, attorney rooms and so we can have more confidential communications with them. And we try and do that not only with people who are alleging specific retaliation or <clears throat> personnel complaints, but we try and mix it up and do it more at random as well. So as not to, um, you know, make it clear who specifically might be complaining and who is, is describing a specific, you know, medical issue or something along those lines. I think I've covered most of the ways in which people can contact us. And I'm sorry, uh, Sean, could I jump in for a moment? Yes. Uh, I just wanted to, on the issue of investigation, as, as uh, Assistant Inspector General Belt said, we generally do not directly investigate individual instances, but uh, as you know, the law has changed dramatically over the years since we began. When we began, we didn't do that because we were legally not empowered to, uh, including by the county ordinances. The legal framework now has changed dramatically and we are legally empowered to conduct investigations uh, both by county ordinance and by state law and given the authority, including subpoena power, but also the ability to direct um, members of the department to cooperate with us. So under, under new law, we are entitled to, and as the deputy gangs under 13670 of the penal code were specifically enumerated as, along with the uh, attorney general, uh, investigators for deputy gang issues uh, to the extent that some of these issues uh, overlap with that. But what, what Ms. Belts is saying is we don't, we don't have the manpower staff uh, or woman power to in personally investigate every complaint. And so we do operate in that way. So we use the information people give us to try to improve uh, conditions, as, as she said, we never violate the confidence of people who trust us because we very much understand how you feel when you're in custody and your life is in the hands of the person who has the, the jail keys. And so you don't necessarily want 
uh, to be a champion of justice at your own personal expense. So we take that, what information people give us, we hold it 100% confidential, and we've never had that breached by any court or any process yet to this day. I, I don't control that, but it hasn't happened yet. And uh, and as Katie says, we are very adept at using techniques that will make sure we don't burn anybody. So we're very careful about that. In uh, appropriate situations, we are legally empowered to investigate. Currently, the sheriff's department obstructs those investigations, and I'm not talking about um, the assistant sheriff who is present, who, who has been very cooperative and, and good with us, but, but the sheriff's department's practices are not to allow us to investigate. We can't interview deputies about, about what they've done, except in very limited circumstances. So um, currently, that's the, the, although we have the legal right, we don't have the practical ability. So that's, uh, I just wanted to clarify that because what Ms. Belt says is, is practically the way it is, but we are um, actively in the process of attempting to use legal process to uh, force the sheriff's department to comply with the law that requires external investigation. So we're not um, dropping that as as an appropriate uh, function of oversight. We're just she sharing the reality of where we're at at this time, so that anybody listening who has a family member who is concerned can understand. We will work with them. We will do what we can to improve conditions. We will protect their anonymity um, completely as much as we can under law, but uh, we don't have the ability necessary to, to step in and, and, and take direct action usually. Okay, well, I, uh, I don't want to be quarrelsome, but you can imagine how disconcerting it is to the families who fear that their loved ones are targeted by groups inside the jail uh, uh, when the sheriff is out there in public saying there's there are no gangs. But um, I think... Uh, if there are no qu questions from uh, more questions from the commissioners, we have at least eight people who would like to comment on this. Commissioner, before before we move on, may I address a couple things on on that last topic? Oh, of course, of course. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, we still have policies and procedures in play from back in 2012 when the 3,000 boy uh, incident occurred with mandatory rotations with other things like that. We're still following those protocols. But I think um, what might give a lot of people maybe a little bit of, of relief here is we're bringing body worn cameras into the jail system now. Uh, we we started our pilot on 3,000 with the sergeants and seniors, the senior line deputies. Uh, now we've rolled it out to I think 39 deputies. We want to expand that to all the jails. Obviously, um, that gives you not only a better ability. We have the DV tell which by the way was a 2012 um, technology. I, I don't have a TV from 2012, but that's the technology we have. But we wanna now um, go further than that, and which will give us the audio and then a better uh, clear picture of all of that. So if, if people have concerns, um, we will should hopefully soon have the body worn camera help that. Um, that might eliminate some of the, the anxiety, I hope. So also for the reporting, we do have signage up in all the housing areas on how to contact OIG and the ACLU. So that might answer your question on how they get hold of them. Much appreciated. I'm happy to hear that about body worn cameras. Uh, uh, Ingrid, should we, or, or Jennifer, should we go to uh, our public? Uh, I have waiting? one more question. Just one. Oh, I'm sorry, Patty. I thought I, I didn't know you had a question. Yeah, it just came up. It just came up uh, because of uh, Assistant Sheriff's Corbett comment. Um, in terms of the in terms of the information that's up, I wanted to make sure that all the information for Priya and how to reach, um, you know, the hotlines for sexual assault and uh, and whether prior or current, that all of that information is also up, still up in, in the in the jails. Yes, ma'am. We take the Priya very, very seriously. And what we're trying to do occasionally is, is actually rotate the signage. Because if you walk by the same sign all the time, it eventually becomes invisible and you don't see it. So change the font, change the color, change certain things on it to make it a little bit more refreshed. Um, and I'll, I'll see how long the Priya has been up, but we do have that everywhere as well. Thank you so much. Ingrid, Jennifer, can we take... Uh... Public comments, and then we'll take a 15 minute break because we've been going a while. That sounds great. So for public comment, if you have not already raised your hand in the participant window, 
and you would like to make a comment on this item, please raise your hand or send a chat to the host. I do have eight individuals who are currently signed up. And just as a special note, if you are on the telephone calling into this meeting and you would like to make a public comment regarding the county jails, please press star three on your telephone to get you in queue. Once I see that you're in queue, I will read off the first six digits of your telephone number and unmute you at that time. So with that being said, we'll go ahead and get started with two minutes for the first person providing public comment is AJ White. You're unmuted, AJ. Uh, Jennifer, uh, hello. Can you can you AJ? Uh, yes, we do, AJ, and I apologize for that. Ingrid, please go ahead with the Spanish comment. Thank you. Buenos días. Si necesita que sus comentarios se traduzcan de español a inglés, simplemente diga la palabra español antes de comenzar y alguien le dará instrucciones a cómo proceder. Gracias. Thank you. And AJ, we do hear you. Please go ahead with your public comment. Okay, thank you. Um, for structure's sake, I'm going to keep on the agenda I put for uh, online for the comments it was regarding LA County Jail Guard to inmate harassment. I experienced them through a term in 2017 to 2018. And uh, basically, uh, two points I'd like to make real quick. Holding guards accountable to potential legal consequences for things such as criminal threats, um, because there's a lot of inmates in there sitting on criminal threats. And um, to update disposition procedures with a little bit more oversight by outside entities, maybe OIG, COC, ACLU, amongst others, um, due to the fact that I had two dispositions and they're regarding involving around things such as criminal threats. Um, I know it happens, but uh, I mean, I don't know, a couple of them. So I'm just, this is not all in my head. I'm not making this up, but one of them was resolved somewhat um, through a nurse and guards, actually. You're saying, this is a tough position. We know it gets tough. Um, people say things they don't mean sometimes. And uh, I just to minimize as much as possible. Guards should be charged sometimes for that. The way things are right now, I, I, I sent a lot of info in. Psych torture, the dividing line as above, so below is hard for people below the line to speak with respect sometimes. Um, dehumanized line between officers and, and civilians. Okay, let's look at those lines, please, and try to maintain balance. And that goes for women's and the you know, facilities for sure. I mean, it, a little bit more humanization there. You know what I mean? So give a little, get a little, I guess, huh? That could go a lot of different ways. But thank you. There's a few, there's a few guards that. I'm not, I mean, they're going to remain, remain nameless, but they're female and male, so that I have dealings with for my turn. So thank you. Thank you. And we will move on to the next comment by MJ King. You're unmuted, MJ. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. On the uh, assistant IG's report, why are we incarcerating pregnant people? It's been two years since voters overwhelmingly passed Measure J to fund alternatives to incarceration. So why are we incarcerating pregnant people? They would be better cared for in the community. This committee needs to urge the Board of Supervisors to fully fund Measure J so that we can reduce the jail population in LA County and give folks the resources that will actually support them. Regarding the toxic water in LASD jails, of course it's toxic. Getting a passing grade from the local government doesn't mean the water's safe. Legal limits have not been updated in 20 years. LADWP has 30 containments, containments in our drinking water, nine of which exceed health guidelines from the Environmental Working Group. For example, arsenic in our drinking water is 430 times the EWG's health guideline. Stop poisoning our most vulnerable community members. LASD is not public safety. As this committee has acknowledged, there has been an increase in shootings increase in in-custody deaths, and families are being harassed and doxxed by the very deputies who murdered their loved ones. Sheriff, Sheriff Villanueva must go, defund LASD, and reinvest our tax dollars in our community. Investing in the community is public safety. Thank you. Thank you. And next we will hear from Yanira Reynoso. You are unmuted. Please go ahead with your comment. Yanira Reynoso, you are unmuted. Would you like to make a comment on this item? Okay, we do not hear you. If you are trying to speak, 
please send a chat to the host. In the meantime, we will move to Tamara K. You're unmuted. Please go ahead, Tamara. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good day. Um, power and strength to the families, the Rhea family and Miss Helen Jones and all the other families impacted by sheriff violence. Um, something definitely needs to be done about building a wave of propaganda, misinformation, the doxing and harassment of the families. Um, the sheriff's department in no way, shape or form can investigate themselves. There absolutely has to be independent investigations on excessive use of force and in custody deaths and family harassment. There needs to be something in place for the protection of these families in any shape or form that the COC has the power to do. Um, I go with, with Ms. Uh, Martina said, there needs to be charter amendments to impeach the sheriff and strengthen the civilian oversight. Um, you know, y'all need more power to have oversight over the sheriff. Um, as far as in custody, um, people in custody, pregnant woman, again, should not be in jail. They cannot be cared for in jail. Um, Measure J, as the last woman that spoke, was voted on. And the measures um, to put community and care first over incarceration and services first. Um, as far as water, there is no water. I'm going to talk about specifically the Linwood Jail. There is no water offered. What, our bodies are made of 70% water. We need water. There's no proper n nutrition. They're putting meds. I believe they're putting meds in the food. It's freezing temperatures. The water is contaminated. There is no outside time of the cell. There is no uh, proper medical uh, care has been denied and delayed. Phone calls are being denied and delayed. No mask wearing of the sheriffs. Um, they don't care about special diets. People are being held after being bailed out. Um, the food, you're getting peanut butter and jelly, orange juice and milk, no healthy food. Um, this specifically Linwood jail. And why are they asking for people's DNA in the Linwood jail? That's like, it, that's injustice. Thank you. And the next comment will come from Ernie Arce. Ernie, you are unmuted. Please go ahead. Okay, so no, no, no worries. Ernie, would you like to make a public comment regarding the LA County jails? 11, 8, 20, okay. I'm not hearing Ernie speaking to us. So we will move on to, it looks like the last speaker will be Michelle Infante. If you have not spoken on this item and you would like to, please be sure that you raise your hand or if you're calling in, press star three. Otherwise, uh, Michelle Infante will be the last speaker. Michelle, you're unmuted. Please go ahead. Thank you. My name is Michelle. I'm with Dignity and Power Now. It's what, Don, what Brendan Corbett says today doesn't translate into what continues to happen inside. We have psychological dehumanizing by the sheriffs. We have poor diets given to pregnant women, bologna and peanut butter sandwiches. Dehumanizing women again by not giving them the proper diets that they deserve. A lack of clean water. The water is brown and there's no clean water and that's been going on for probably more than a decade. Raping women inside. Sexual language and innuendos coming from the sheriff's department to the women that are inside these facilities locked down and have nowhere to go. A lack of education. High prices and commissary. <clears throat> Why do we continue to keep the sheriff in the position that he's in? We definitely need a change in our charter amendment and the ACLU has brilliantly brought forward a charter that we can use. We cannot continue to allow the lack of care that women are receiving inside these facilities because when they come out and I'm outreaching, the answers that the sheriff's department and the OIG has appeared today are not the answers that I'm being given by inmates that are being released when they come out. Bologna sandwiches and peanut butter sandwiches for women that are pregnant and brown water that comes out of a faucet is okay. It's appalling to, to work for an organization and be working with and collaborating with the civilian oversight, the OIG's office and the County Board of Supervisors and still be here talking about these same issues. 
please bring forward the charter amendment that the ACLU has brought forward. It will allow us to impeach the sheriff when these type of things are continuously going on for the last four years under Sheriff Villanueva's uh, tenure. Thank you. And we do have uh, three more people who did sign up. So Stephanie Luna, you are unmuted. Please go ahead with your comment. Yeah, I just want to say that the uh, crisis within the jails is something that should definitely be discussed here all the time, especially considering the increase of in custody deaths and the inconsistent autopsy findings that follow following protocols and procedures since 2012. Yet in 2021, 55 people have died in custody. Deputy gangs do exist within the jails and those body cams. They're just going to end up being edited or accidentally turned off. So talk about it. Talk about it all the time. Thank you. Thank you. And next we will hear from Helen Jones. Helen, you're unmuted. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we do. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, just to hear Brandon Corbett um, um, admit that uh, there is a problem with the 3,000 boys deputy gang. I haven't really heard um, an official in the sheriff department admit that ever coming out of their mouth, except by Lee Baca. And at one time, the sheriff, uh, Ben Weber, you know, admitted that there was gangs and then retracted his statement back. But just to hear somebody from the sheriff department in 22, 2022, admit that the sheriff, the 3,000 boys exist. That's a problem, and I'm glad that he done that because so many times we keep hearing there is no gang, there's no 3,000 boys, there's no 2,000 boys. He just admitted that, and to know that our families are caught up in these jails and they're always trying to say, oh, this person committed crime. Everybody that go to jail don't commit crime. Everybody in jail, a lot of people we know today are, are, are innocent. There's even people that went to the gas chamber and let you, been electrocuted that's been innocent. So you can't just put everybody in the jail saying that everybody is guilty. So would this need to change? Because he admitted that today, and I really appreciate him admitting that. So this is something that needs to change, saying that there is no gangs. These gangs are violent. They, they deadly. They don't prove how violent they are. And I just wish that this commission will listen to the family because we know we have the proof. We have the proof in our depositions. We have the proof in our autopsy report. We know who these gang members are because they are in our report. And if this commission will take the time out and meet with the families in the future, and I mean really sit down and let us help, this commission identify the name of these gang members. We would love to help y'all do that because we are already seeing that what's been going on hasn't worked. So please let us, the families and the communities, help y'all make this change in the sheriff department. Thank you. Thank you. And we do have one more person who has signed up for public comment. Andres Kwan, you're the last speaker on this item. Please go ahead, Andres. Good morning. Uh, Andres Kwan with the ACLU commissioners. We are facing a crisis uh, yet again under Sheriff Villanueva, uh, whom uh, we at the ACLU Southern California have deemed as, as the single greatest threat uh, to our civil liberties here in LA County. Um, He's the Trump of Los Angeles. Uh, we've called it uh, time and time again uh, from his repeated violations of the law and, and complete obstruction of uh, the Civilian Oversight Commission of the OIG of Oversight, his special police unit intended to intimidate and harass oversight officials uh, to the scourge of deputy gang violence that he has enabled, <clears throat> which is correlated to the dramatic increase in deputy violence, shootings, and record level deaths in jails under his watch. Um, yeah, we have the Trump of Los Angeles, uh, and in particular in deputy gangs, uh, Villanueva has gone from denying the existence of them uh, to claiming that they are harmless fraternities and then adopting and claiming to adopt a policy that uh, is not only meaningless, but 
we believe that it does not even comply with new state law and law enforcement gaps. Uh, all the while defying lawful subpoenas and violating laws and transparency and oversight. Uh, uh, but here today, at least as Sister Helen mentioned, we had Deputy Corbett acknowledging uh, the 3,000 boys and the existence of deputy gangs. Uh, and the reemergence of these deputy gangs, especially in the jails, is deeply troubling. And uh, it, it, it's not shocking then that the OIG's fourth quarterly report confirms that 2021 was by far the most violent and deadly. So what can we do? First off, first off, we must close in a central jail, period. Second, we must implement the ATI recommendations the border has already adopted. And finally, we implore you to recommend to the board that it propose to voters a charter amendment that will strengthen sheriff accountability and create common sense structure of checks and balances. Thank you. And Chair Kennedy, that does conclude all of the public comments for this item. Thank you. It is 1045 and I think we should take a break. So why don't we resume at, uh, well, 1046, we'll resume at 1101.
And we have just about two minutes before we will resume from our break. If you are a commissioner or a speaker and are in front of your computer, please turn your video on so that we can account for everyone who's currently here. Will do, Jennifer. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, and it is 1101. If you are a commissioner in front of your computer, please turn your video camera on and Chair Kennedy, whenever you would like to begin. All right, we are back after the break and uh, the next item on the agenda is about the uh, family assistance program. But I, my understanding is that one of our um, presenters is going to be here a little late. So I've been asked to move to agenda item four, and then we'll go back to three. Agenda, agenda item four is general public comment, uh, not limited to the topic of the jails that we just did. So um, I think we'll just go ahead and do that. Okay, sounds good. Uh, Ingrid, if you would like to make the Spanish announcement, and then I will remind folks how to get in queue. Uh, Ingrid, we do not hear you, but I do see that you're unmuted. Um, still not hearing Ingrid, I will just say again, if you would like to make general public comment, again, this is anything regarding the LA County Sheriff's Department, please raise your hand that is opening up the participant window and clicking on the small hand icon. When it's shaded in, your hand is raised and you are in queue. If you have called in on the telephone, please press star three on your phone. That will put you on queue. And then uh, when I see that you are in queue, I will read the first six digits of your telephone number and unmute you to have you begin speaking. And again, we'll go back to see if Ingrid, are you ready to make the Spanish announcement? Yes. Okay. Uh, buenos días. Si necesitan traducciones a sus comentarios de español a inglés, simplemente diga la palabra español y alguien le dirá cómo proceder con sus comentarios. Gracias. Thank you. And Chair Kennedy, before we begin, are we doing two minutes per person? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So we'll get started with Tamara K. Two minutes. You are unmuted. Yes. Um, so just to follow up from, you know, the jails, um, one, men, we need to close the jails, period. But one, men should not be um, overseeing a woman's facility, period, um, for many reasons mentioned. Two, I'm a little confused how y'all say you cannot investigate independent um, in-custody deaths and abuse um, that somehow they need to be pulled together, um, you know, because this is a problem. We need independent investigations um, for people in custody. Um, the jails just need to be closed because obviously if you all are acknowledging and aware that there are sheriff gangs, and this has been going on 50 years, and this is an internal issue, 
People are being killed in, in custody. What was it, 55 this year alone? Um, you know, this is unacceptable. Like, the state, the sheriffs, the COC, the Board of Supervisors, Rand Corporation are all acknowledging their sheriff gangs, murders taking place. They're killing children like Andreas Gordado and A.J. Weber. You know, um, what about Jelani Lovett recently? What about John Horton? Y'all have not, we have, Ms. Horton hasn't, and Ms. Jones hasn't seen justice, and she can't even get justice because that would mean John would be, still be here, right? Um, but so how about some accountability for that mother that's been fighting for her son for 13 years? Everybody acknowledges that this is a deep-seated problem. The banditos, the Vikings, the executioners, the 3,000 boys, the list goes on and on. And everybody acknowledges it, but nothing's being done. You know, um, this needs to be, like, you know, it needs to be disman disband dismantled. You know, um, independent investigations. They cannot, the people responsible for the crime cannot investigate themselves, period. We need, we need better measures in place to protect the families. And we need to just ban it and abolish it because this has been going on too long, right? And these families need protection. Thank you. And that does conclude your time. Next, we will hear from Richie Serjenko. Richie, you're unmuted. Please go ahead. Hi, yes, this is Richie Serjanko from the People's City Council. Um, you know, I, I agree with T said the jails need to be need to be closed. Um, there's been 175 percent uh, rise in in custody deaths for LASD uh, since 2016. Um, and, you know, uplift the names of Jelani Lovett and John Horton, um, you know, obviously died, died in custody of LASD and um, you know, wondering what what kind of accountability is gonna is gonna happen for that. Um, I also want to urge this commission to demand uh, the board of supervisors overhaul the entire sheriff's department, including a ballot measure that would amend the LA County Charter to maximize civilian oversight and community control over the sheriff and LASD. Um, LASD has a pattern and practice of intimidation and retaliation towards uh, any political dissidents. Um, you know, uh, obviously with the, the publicly targeting the Rhea and the Vargas families, and we heard this morning from uh, the, the multiple families and, and including Sister Helen Jones, John Horton, and David Ordaz Jr. and, and Marco Vasquez Jr. They all say how they are victims of, of harassment in the Sheriff's Department. And so think about how insidious it is for the people, uh, the state to, to kill someone and then harass their families. Um, you know, obviously you are all uh, understanding of, uh, of the sheriff's uh, harassment and intimidation and retaliation. Uh, surely gets directed at you. Uh, for me, Sheriff Villanueva posted about me on Instagram a few weeks ago, uh, calling me uh, a communist and uh, saying that I, I'm leading the charge against a Latino sheriff uh, and, and this and that. Um, it's clear it's not really the best thing for the top gangbang cop in the country to be posting my face like that, um, but also fuck Alex Villanueva. Thank you. And next we will hear from Valerie Vargas. You're unmuted. Please go ahead, Valerie. Yeah, can you hear me? We do, yes, please go ahead. Uh, good morning, uh, my name is Valerie Vargas and I am family of Anthony Vargas and um, I really don't wanna be here calling in but I need to make this like on public uh, record. Um, we've been calling into the COC about the family harassment for the past three years and what Alex did on his live feed on uh, February 28th, he publicly doxed my family and he did it again for the theatrical letter that he sent to the Board of Supervisors naming me on the bottom of the letter. Now, I'm not a politician. I'm a civilian. I'm an impacted family member that he wrote on this letter. And um, I can't, I, I, I can't, I'm having a hard time understanding why it's so difficult for the county to provide some kind of protection for people who Alex is doxing. Like since he, since he had done that live, he, sublimin he subliminally sent out a green light to these deputies that we live down the street from. Like, I don't, I don't even know how to, how to um, 
Let me give you a let me give you an example, okay? My aunt has cancer right now, and I'm taking her to her chemo sessions, and I'm having deputies in back of me, and my aunt, who's already facing the horror and the fear of her mortality, is worried about my own. I don't need to worry about my aunt worrying if I get pulled over and if I make a wrong move. And if I already know that these deputies have it in for me, they wanna snatch me. She's worried about my life being taken and, and the lives of the family that, of, the fam of my family that lives on that block. Like, I just, I don't understand. I don't understand why it's so difficult to have something in place. Like it's, it's, it's a real life thing. You know, we have, we have publicly well-documented every single harassment, every single names. Like something just needs to be done, man. Like I, I can't see myself living like this for another year. Thank you. And next we will hear from Avelia Gonzalez. You're unmuted. Please go ahead with your comment, Avelia. Good morning, can you hear me? We do. I'm here today to express my concern about the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department practices. It has already been proven that there are violent gangs within the department and, that prey on whistleblowers and our community. My son, Angel Reynosa, was 19 years old when he applied for the department as a sheriff deputy. As much as I tried to convince him not to, and I even tried to bribe him, he was committed that he wanted to help people and create change in the department. My son was a target and continues to be a target of the sheriff's department. My son's training officer ordered him to falsify a police report. And there is proof of that. After he confronted his training officer about his lack of integrity, they retaliated against him. Deputies like his training officer are committing crimes and they are not being held accountable for their actions. These deputies are placed in this position of power to protect members of this community, but instead cannot even gain our trust because of their hostile and corrupt actions. Who protects the community from the sheriff's department? That's a question I wanna ask. This system is broken. The leadership in this department has failed and they need to be removed and replaced with people that actually care about this community. People that will lead the department in the right direction. We need Sheriff Villanueva out. He is not a leader. I plead to this committee to make recommendations to the Board of Supervisors to remove Sheriff Villanueva from his position and to take the necessary steps to start fixing this broken system for the safety of our community. My heart goes out to all the families that have been impacted I pray that we all get justice. Thank you for your time and thank you for allowing this platform for us to speak. Thank you for that, Evalia. And the next comment will come from Terry Lovett. Terry, you're unmuted. Please go ahead with your comment. Yes, I'm, I'm the mother of Jelani Lovett that was murdered there in September of 2021. I'm hearing all the comments from the family about their fear of the Justice Department, of the Sheriff's Department in LA. It's sad, it's really sad that, that they can't walk down the street, that they're harassed by the Sheriff's Department. What kind of people do y'all have in power down there? I don't understand it. It's like LA is not even a part of the state of California. They do what they wanna do in LA and it's sad. Uh, the sheriff holds no accountability to what happened to my son. The board of supervisors hold no accountability. I was told I was going to be contacted by the uh, by the commissioner's office in January when I spoke at Family Impact. I have yet to be contacted. I have put in a, a complaint with the inspector general down there I, in November of last year, I have not been answered by the Inspector General. I have not been answered by Alex Venezuela. I, I mean, it, it's sad. It's like LA is not even a part of California. Y'all have your own rules down there. You know, uh, I'm going to do everything that I can in my power to hold LA sheriffs accountable for my son's death. He didn't deserve that. Nobody deserves to be beat by the people that we put in power to protect us. That's my only comment. Thank you, Terry. And next we will hear from MJ King. MJ, you're unmuted, please go ahead. Sure, uh, LASD has proven that they cannot investigate themselves. This commission has acknowledged the deputy gangs operating within LASD. You've acknowledged and apologized to the families that continue to experience harassment at the hands of the deputies who stole their loved ones. 
I support an LA County Charter Amendment to keep the sheriff accountable, specifically an amendment that will establish an impeachment process to allow removal of the sheriff for serious misconduct, to reinforce the BOS's policymaking authority over the sheriff's department and establish permanent and independent civilian oversight. It's been two years since the Board of Supervisors promised to close Men's Central Jail. Close it. LASD is toxic. LASD is dangerous. LASD is not public safety. Defund LASD and reinvest that $3 billion a year in universal needs such as housing, jobs, and child care, pandemic recovery, built environment. Reinvesting in our communities over police isn't radical. Social scientists and public health experts have proven that investment in the community decreases crime and the need for police. Via Nueva must go, you must defund LASD. Thank you. And next we will hear from Helen Jones. Helen, you're unmuted. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you, Jennifer. Um, yes, the men's central jail needs to be closed. But before it do close, we would love to see a government forensic team go in and spray the chemical luminol to see all the blood splatter from the criminals and the crimes that they have committed inside the jails. It saddens me just to hear all the families over the last 13 years and just hear how they cry about who do we turn to? Who do the sheriff department answer to? And from what we see, it's no one. They don't respect this commission. They don't respect the county board of supervisors. So we just like at a loss, like, what do we do? You know, what else could we say to, to make this change in the sheriff department? The sheriff department is the only department that jail us, they house us, and then they patrol us on the street. That's too much power. That's too much power for any organization. You get the jealous in the jails. You get the intimidators inside the jails. You know our phone numbers. You know our addresses. You know our family members. You know our kids that you don't kill. You know where we live at. And then you get to come out to the street and patrol us, stalk us at our houses, retaliate against us, threaten us, intimidate us, the sheriff department got too much power. Either this, this, we need, that's what we need to change. Either the sheriff department going to patrol or you going to howl. They shouldn't be able to do both. And that's what we need to do is fight the sheriff department on that and take some of that power away from them because they hands in too much. They monopolizing the system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And next we will hear from Melissa Camacho Chung. You're unmuted. Please go ahead. Hello, this is Melissa Camacho Chung from the ACLU of Southern California. Um, I want to thank the COC for getting the OIG's fourth quarter report, um, as they always do, and just want to uplift the absolute crisis with regard to in custody deaths. We are seeing more deaths in custody than in any time since the California Department of Justice started recording in 2005. And this isn't because of COVID. 55 people died in custody this year, and that's the rate of more than a person a week. But even if we were to take out the COVID numbers from this year, that would be 47 people. That would still be more than any year going back to 2005. I appreciate the focus that this commission has taken lately on conditions in CRDF and particularly with pregnant people there, but that's 15 people. Uh, and we have 55 people who died last year. I would like to see the commission devote the same amount of time and energy on looking into the issue of in-custody deaths and what can be done. Now, the inspector general has already said before this commission and before the board of supervisors that what needs to be done is to reduce overcrowding. Uh, the Inspector General has said that we need to get the population down to 12,000. At this commission September meeting, Commissioner Rubin and Max Huntsman both said that, and today the population still remains well above 13,000. At this commission's October meeting, staff recommended an ad hoc committee to draft recommendations to assist LASD and its justice partners in reducing the jail population. As far as I'm aware, that ad hoc committee was not created and the commission has not made recommendations to the county. 
the commission needs to get involved in the conversation around decarceration so that people can be safe and lives can be saved. Thank you very much. Thank you. And next we will hear from Michelle Infante. Please go ahead, Michelle. Thank you. This is Michelle Infante with Dignity Power Now. This isn't about more solutions. This is about implementing ideas and solutions you already have been given. With over 100 deaths in custody since 2019, do you really believe our jails are a safe place for people to be housed when people are dying? And we don't even know why, because the sheriff doesn't come out with a one, two, three, four page report for over a year after the death has been committed and a killing has been committed inside our jails. LASD is being allowed to commit genocide against black and brown families here in LA County. And he's been doing it since he started and he was hired. We have the OIG, the COC, the BOS put in place to hold Alex accountable and nothing is being done and your hands are tied. The solution is to support the charter amendment. Remove the sheriff and definitely do not vote him in our next election. He is a thug at best and so is his department. Does that conclude your remarks, Michelle? Yes, thanks, Jennifer. Thank you. And next we will hear from Ernie Ars. You're unmuted. Please go ahead, Ernie. <laughs> Ernie Ars, would you like to make a comment? Okay. Hearing, hearing nothing, we will move to Pastor Q. You're unmuted. Please go ahead, Pastor Q. Good morning. Can you guys hear me? We do. Yes. An elected official without accountability is a tyrant. And that's exactly what the sheriff have been demonstrating to us. Just because someone breaks the law does not give people the right to treat them unjustly. If you treat them unjustly, you have broken God's moral law. Romans 13 does not say that the government nor the dominant culture has a right to mistreat you because you broke the law. So. I'd like to say to our society, quit using Romans 13 to justify your own evil. What good is the law if it allows injustice against those who break it? If someone steals food, it's not the same as stealing millions of dollars. There's no script that condones injustice and abuse against people who are in custody, none. The sheriff department is destabilizing our community when you have a sector of society that believes the sheriff can do no wrong and another sector of society who are being abused by the sheriff or by law enforcement in general, that's a recipe for disaster. Dr. King said, riot is the voice of the unheard. I'm here to echo that idea today by saying, violence is the voice of the unheard. Uh, violence is the voice of the unheard. If we do not act, we are cultivating an environment of rebellion. And in this 30 year anniversary of the uprising that was sparked, or I wouldn't say spark, it was fueled because the undergirding was already there. The environment was already ripe for that type of violence. And the environment and the spark that lit the the fuse for the 1992 uprising, we are in that same type of environment now. Do something. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Yanira Reynoso. You're unmuted. Please go ahead. Okay, and still hearing nothing from her. We will move to AJ White. You're unmuted. Please go ahead, AJ. Um, actually, my hand was still raised. I made a comment regarding the jails. I'm sorry, I need to. Is, is my hand still raised? It is, but no problem. You don't have to make a comment if you don't want. Okay. No, I, I spoke. Thank you. Okay. And then yeah, that yeah. moves us to our last comment will be from Leah Garcia. Um, if you have not raised your hand and you would like to comment on this item, please be sure that you raise your hand or send a chat to the host. But Leah, please go ahead. Can you hear me? We do. Um, hi. Um, I don't even know where to begin. Um, like Valerie Barda, you know, that gave 
what he did to our families um, gave the green light for more harassment. Like we don't get enough. Um, I just had a baby, you know, and I just being in the car with my newborn baby, I'm always in fear when I come to Paul's memorial, when um, it, it's just a, a scary feeling for myself. Um, being with my kids, you know, um, he tried, Villanueva tried to, you know, make me look like a fool um, because I had a, a emotional outburst. Of course I did. Saavedra, the killer of my son, Paul Rea, he could be in our community. My own son can because he took that from him. He's over there, you know, laughing at me. That is not, it, it is, that's, it's sick to me. It's sickening. It is sickening, you know, that we have to deal with this. Um, it, it's, I'm lost of, of words. I really don't even know what to say at this point. This is not a way, like Valerie Vargas said, it's not a way of life. Like how much more can we take? How much more? Thank you. Thank you. And we have three more people who have raised their hands. Stephanie Luna, you're next. Please go ahead, Stephanie. Yeah, good morning. Uh, my name is Stephanie Luna. I am the family of Anthony Vargas. Um, I don't even know where to start with all this. You know, we, the sheriff's department has been working diligently to silence families. Um, Alex consistently showed us exactly who he is and what kind of department he's allowing to thrive and what kind of department he is running. In February, there was a two hour press conference that took place where Villanueva went on to publicly dox my family and the family of Paul Rea. You know, he went on to not only dox the families, but he publicly put the picture out of a minor, you know, which I don't, I can't understand how that's not a problem. Um, you know, he went on to say that all the claims of harassment that we have filed have been found un unsubstantiated and have only been consecutive consecutively coming from two families. Um, he's alleging that we're being coerced by the board of supervisors and that's where he's wrong. You know, we're the families that have had our loved ones murdered by the sheriff's department. We're the families being harassed, intimidated, docked, thrown out of public community meetings and are the ones still standing here speaking up against him and his department. You know, we're still standing here documenting our harassment publicly because we know what happens when a deputy investigates a deputy. You know, we're aware that this is a clear attempt to punish us for speaking out against him. And we also know that it's an attempt to send a message to other impacted family members that they should be afraid to speak out against him. And I don't even know what to say about that. You know, like, I don't even know where to go with that. All I do know is that, you know, the CLC definitely needs to urge the board to put this charter amendment on the ballot because we've been dealing with this behavior for 50 years. And if we don't do something now, it's going to be another 50 years. Sister Helen Jones has been fighting for justice for 12 years. And, you know, here we are today in 2022 dealing with the same type of sheriff and the same misconduct. Thank you. Thank you. And next is Angel Reynosa. You're unmuted. Go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? We do. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Angel Reynosa. I'm a former Los Angeles County Deputy Sheriff. Um, I just decided to talk about, you know, everything that I experienced while on the department. Um, you know, I always wanted to join law enforcement and help out people in my community. I grew up in an area that wasn't the best. Um, there was a lot of high crime rate. And uh, I wanted to join the police force, you know, to make change. But once you join the force, you kind of notice that it's not how it's pictured in the TV shows or in the movies. You see that the stuff that they make you do, um, the things that they order you, their tactics, it's not right. Um, and when you try to speak out against it, you're essentially punished. You're deemed as a bad person. You know, you're not a part of their group no more. So they do whatever they want to get you out because you're not following their instructions. And I, I I've spoken with many family members who've been affected by the department and it's within the past month and it's been you know it's extreme to see how like their cases haven't been resolved and how they kind of defend people you know who have murdered people and you know they were unjustified they broke policy they did something wrong and they still you know are patrolling today or they haven't been you know disciplined basically and I, I just think, you know, we need change, you know, um, I personally seen so many bad things I've seen 
within while well, my time patrolling and in the jail facilities. Um, I'll leave it for the court system to, you know, release all that public information, but there's a lot of bad things that that go on and I, I just think we need change and I hope we can because at this point, sometimes it kind of feels like we're like a broken record. We're, we're repeating the same things, but nothing's changing. Like we come every what month, two or three months and nothing's happening. So I hope we can find a solution how to um, fix this problem. And thank you guys. Thank you. And we have two more public comments. Next is Douglas Jessup. Douglas, please go ahead. Right, so my name's Douglas Jessup. Um, I'm a leader in, in many different spaces. I've, I've led with, I've, I've gotten certificates from senators. I'm a leader in, in Los Angeles reentry, LARC. I've been in the space of social justice advocacy for quite a, quite some time. The reason why I'm commenting is because my case entirely was was based off of sheriff corruption, sheriff misconduct, and I was unlawfully incarcerated and wrongfully convicted. Since I've came been out here in Los Angeles, it's it's simply been the same exact thing. The same exact thing going from the informant scandal where they what they do is they get people by you um, to to report wrong information, report false information to to kind of cover up the the corruption that is that they're facing. I I, I thoroughly believe in change occurring, and I and I see one thing that causes it so change doesn't happen is they're able to kind of bypass what's happening through legal jargon and just to kind of fool people. You know, it's it's sad to see so many different individuals speak up against the injustices of the sheriff's department and the sheriff kind of just just acting like it doesn't matter. I was when I was in jail, I seen many inmates actually get beat down. I've seen inmates get killed, and in just in the social justice realm, there's been so many different people that have passed away untimely. I think now there is a time that actually we are in a position to actually hold the sheriffs accountable and also cooperate. Even though if this happened to me by the hands of the sheriff, so I'm also very, very negotiable on how this needs to be done. It's 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 sad to, it's 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 time that we finally got people that spoke up for the people and that actually represented it to the T. You know, I think ultimately anybody's objective should really be in a, in a to live in a safer community. And right now, it's it's simply not happening for those of us that are of color and come from marginalized communities. Thank you. And our very last public comment for general public comment will come from Carlos Montes. Carlos, you're unmuted. Please go ahead. Yes. Good morning. My name is Carlos Montes. I'm a member of Centro CSO in Ball Heights, uh, East LA, longtime uh, community activist. I'm also a member of the Ball Heights Neighborhood Council. I'm here to support the families who have lost their loved ones and are can, now are still being harassed by Villa Nueva. Villanueva's got to go. I say adios Villanueva, boot the banditos. The banditos are the gang at East LA that killed Paul Rea, Anthony Vargas, and many more young men that over the years we forgot their names like Edward Rodriguez. And I'm also here to say that, um, you know, uh, remember during the Colts Commission doing similar testimony, we need systemic change. I support the proposal for a charter amendment to give the Civilian Oversight Commission more power, more oversight over the sheriff. And, you know, and also the ability to remove the sheriff when he violates the law. You know, I'm an elected official of the Boa Heights Neighborhood Council, but I'm an advisor. I don't have no power. I could just advise uh, Kevin DeLeon of the city council. We have a small budget. And so we have an advisory power. So you all don't have any real power. You have subpoena power. So a charter amendment would make you a permanent department of the county and give you the power to really have oversight and power over the sheriff. And we're talking about people power, a democratic process where the people rule, power to the people has been a slogan for years. And I will add that, you know, we need civilian community control over the sheriff. Even the Coles Commission recommended advisory groups at East Sheriff Station, but it ended up being appointed by the captain. So that was a joke. So I'm here to support the families, support the, the proposal for a charter amendment that you asked the Board of Supervisors to put it on the agenda, to vote on it, so we could vote on it at the November election. So uh, thank you very much, and the struggle continues. I've been in the county jail too, by the way, being abused and seeing the violence. Thank you very much. Eric Kennedy, 
That does conclude all of our public comment for general public comment. Thank you. I uh, unfortunately I don't think there's anyone from the sheriff's department uh, here to um, to listen to the comments from the family members and the uh, the young man who spoke about his experiences as being a a, a member of the department. And um, I don't understand why we don't have a representative here. Um, Ryan, maybe we can take that up. I know it's a recurring issue. <laughs> I'm going to sure. go back. I'm going to go back to our um, last item, item number three, which is a uh, presentation and discussion regarding the LA County uh, Family Assistance Program. Uh, this is a product of the um, COC, and uh, we, for a long time, have been advocating for the creation of support for the families of uh, victims of police violence uh, as they struggle uh, through that process. And my, under uh, my understanding is that um, the board asked the uh, Office of Inspector General and us and other county agencies uh, to work together to talk about uh, taking what was a um, groundbreaking pilot program and turn it into a permanent family assistance program. And um, Ingrid, do we have our uh, representative from the Office of Violence Prevention here? I'm sorry, Ingrid, we can't hear you. She's not on yet. Um, she will be joining us at noon, but I can go ahead and start the presentation um, and move forward with it. And hopefully by the time uh, the presentation is over, we can have her join us and she can expand on some of the things that I cover. I appreciate you uh, filling in. No, no problem. Um, so, Jen, if you want to let me know when I can, I can start. Yeah, I think it's yeah. all, we're good. Okay. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Um, before I begin, I'd like to just take a moment to acknowledge all the families who have lost a loved one, either through an in custody death or a fatal use of force. Um, I thank you for your courage and your tenacity over the years with sharing um, your stories with us, whether through public comment or meeting with us in person. Thank you for for just continuing to to uplift your voices. Um, for our attendees and anyone else present, I'd like to also recognize that the subject matter is heavy. So if you need to take a moment for yourself to walk away or take a deep breath, please be assured that our meeting is recorded. So you can always come back and, um, and take a look at it at your leisure. As of today, the Family Assistance Program has not achieved permanent status or funding. And though the program involves the collaboration of several county departments, this afternoon or morning, I will be providing a high level overview of the pilot years of the family assistance program and the proposed design under the Office of Violence Prevention. Once permanent status and funding are achieved, we hope to come back to the commission and present as a full team and discuss the implementation of the program. I'd like to start with uh, just providing a bit of a background on the program itself. From the onset of the Civilian Oversight Commission, community members expressed their concerns regarding the level of community uh, communication and services families received following deputy involved uh, uses of force. In response, the Commission's Family Assistance and Ad Hoc met with affected families and other stakeholders to identify systemic issues to develop and to develop recommendations to ensure that the families receive the assistance they needed. Uh, we met a few years back, the Ad Hoc met with many families that had lost someone due to a uh, police violence. Um, it was a three, four hour meeting where families were attended with us, they shared their stories with us. And so from that, um, some of the concerns that they brought to us was that their frustration was not only the traumatic event that had taken place, but also the re-traumatization of having to relive that event every time they needed to communicate with a county department to get any type of information. 
So we work as a team, we often work in silos. And so unfortunately, that limited the, the flow of information to the families. And you can imagine what that must be like to have to pick up the phone to ask, where is my loved one's body? When will we be able to see it? And not have an answer with the first person you talk to. So you're given another phone number and you reach out to somebody else and they don't have an answer for you. But in that time frame, you've already expressed and relive that trauma twice. So for us, it was important that we set out to develop a program that not only addressed these issues, but ensured that every single county department involved with this process was well aware of what the other departments were as far as their responsibilities and how they could get that information to, to the families. Um, following the report, there was a recommendation also to ensure that the sheriff's department sees from referring to the decedents as gang members. We often hear from the family members, the adults, right? We hear from the mothers, the fathers, the wives, the siblings. But we rarely hear from the children of some of the men who have passed away and the women that have passed away. And it's in this particular issue of having to hear that your father or your brother was recognized in the media as a gang member and having to go back to school and talk to your peers and having to explain all that is just something that no one should have to go through, especially not a child. Um, at that meeting that I just uh, shared with you, we actually had a family come and talk to us, uh, a daughter and a son, and they both just candidly shared their struggles of having to go back to school and just having such a challenge with that and making sense of why their father was not no longer with them, but also having to, to sit during school and, and, and concentrate. And you can, all, you can all imagine what that must have been like for them. So that was something that we felt we needed to immediately take a look at and we needed to immediately try to fix. And at the time, the Homicide Bureau uh, chief or, uh, was very, very, uh, just very responsive to that. And I believe following a couple of those meetings that, that stopped. Um, did it stop forever? I don't think so, but it did stop. And so with that in mind, we set out to really design a program that would help get these families the information they needed with not only timeliness, but with the trauma response care that they, that they deserve. Um, the essence of this program and the objective of the program is not only the communication that we provide to these families, but it's really just to recognize the humanity in the families and the people who have passed away. Um, so for us, that's, that's where we are. That's what we keep in mind whenever we, we take a look at ways to improve it. We recognize that this program is not perfect and that it probably will never be, but that there's always room for improvement and there's room for collaboration. I'm um, gonna go ahead and talk to you about the pilot years. So the program started on August 1st. The pilot really was meant to be a pilot year, but it ended in uh, November 2021 when the funding ceased or all of the funding was um, utilized. Um, from August 2019 through November 2021, the program had a total of 115 deaths that occurred that qualified, uh, that had qualified families for the assistance services. However, only 45 families received services from the program, which is about 40%. 24 families uh, received financial assistance for burial expenses. 21 families uh, only received assistance from DMH uh, advocates to connect with community resources and mental health services. Of the families that did not receive services, some of the reasoning was uh, they couldn't find the next of kin to actually get in contact, or they just uh, simply declined at the time. One thing to note is that the burial expense, expense fund of this program is something that was uh, novel and that we received much pushback. But our, our intent was to recognize that the families weren't at fault, that this wasn't a commentary of liability or fault, but this was just acknowledging once again their humanity and the challenges that they were facing going through all of this trauma. So with that intent, the ad hoc pushed forward and, and pushed to make sure that there was funding identified specifically for the, uh, 
the burial funding um, piece. After the pilot program, we were asked through the motion to uh, receive community feedback. Um, and we held a town hall where we heard not only from family members, but we heard from professionals, um, from people from county, from the county, as well as community-based organizations that have worked directly with these families. Um, this program is what it is, yes, because there are departments from the county that are working well within it. But it's also what it is, and these families are receiving the, the support that they need because there are so many community-based organizations that are out there doing the work, that are out there talking to whoever they need to talk, that are guiding these families, that are holding their hand through this really traumatic experience. Um, so as some of the community feedback that we received was um, some participants were not aware that the program existed. Um, and so that's something that we definitely in redesigning this program, we definitely want to highlight the program and make sure that there are effective ways to outreach to the community. This, this, uh, the county's huge, so it's, it's imperative that we do our due diligence and make sure that all of the communities in the county know that this program exists, whether they're Spanish speaking or Indian speaking, whatever the language is, whether it's the eight different languages that are covered, that's something that we've now are keeping in mind and realize that we need to do that and, and really uplift the program so everybody knows that that this program exists. Not only the residents, but it's, it's imperative that all of our county partners know that this program exists because there are so many so many other county programs that are effective that could help service some of these families. And so we just need to make sure that we bring that together. Um, after learning um, more about the program, some families did highlight its value um, for the grieving families that could that they couldn't receive in other programs, um, such as the Victims of Crime Fund. Uh, many families whose loved ones had died as a result of a fatal use of force also highlighted the need, again, for outreach efforts to be led by community-based organizations, because many of them shared their ambivalence, right? Um, if you just witnessed your son or daughter or your, your husband be shot, you may, by an LASB uh, representative or deputy, you may not feel very comfortable seeking um, assistance or guidance from somebody with a county badge, whether it's, you know, someone like me, someone from the Department of Mental Health who did an amazing job going through the pilot, becoming the advocate for those families, we did, they did recognize, and we all did recognize that at that moment of trauma, you are not very trusting of anyone that has that county uh, seal behind them, right? So that's something that uh, we kept in mind, and it's a lesson that we learned that we need to bring these community based organizations to the table because they have that experience, they have that rapport with the family members, and they are not county. Um, additionally, mental health services should be a key component of the program. Though uh, the advocates did a wonderful job at trying to get uh, these type of services to the families whenever the families uh, reached out to them, the funding isn't there to provide the service. And so that's something that this new program we hope to identify and, and have funding there so that these families can receive the, the mental health services that they need, right? It's, and it's not just one member of the family, it's the entire family, it's the children, it's the parents, it's the siblings or the spouses that all need that, that essential mental health service, mental health support. Um, and oftentimes, as we all know, insurance doesn't cover that, or they just don't do a great job of providing that consistent support that they need. Um, additionally, uh, the status updates that families received were inconsistent. And so that's something, again, that the families gave us feedback on, uh, not only during our listening session, but through uh, surveys and through comments that we've heard um, throughout the many, uh, many commission meetings we've had, we've heard, you know, what is the status of the autopsy report? What is the status of the investigation? I don't know, when will our family receive the body-worn camera footage? All of these things were things that were echoed back to us that though the family assistance program existed, these questions still kind of loomed up in the air and were not, were not clarified to some of the families. Um, 
another another thing that was brought to my attention recently um, was the burial fund piece. Though it exists and though it helps, um, there's a component that if the family receives that funding directly, then they may be affected uh, later on when they do their taxes. So that's something that we need to take a look at further. As far as lessons learned, um, some of the lessons learned were regarding next of kin notification. And again, the need for having not only a family assistance advocate present during the next of kin notification, but it is the opinion of uh, the collective group of OIG, COC, and OVT that also someone from the Department of Medical Examiner Coroner be present and investigated to provide that next of kin notification to the family members because they may not be in a place where they want to see an LASD representative. Um, DMEC's understaffing hindered the ability to comfort and support families during this notification process as well. Um, another lesson learned was culturally appropriate and linguistically competent trauma-informed support. Again, we recognize that this is a very traumatic event and it's asking a lot of the families to have to also to have to also teach themselves how to navigate and how to be even healed in that type of situation. So it really should be our responsibility as county representatives to know that and to, to approach them from that trauma-centered perspective, utilizing that. So that is uh, something that, again, the, the department, uh, not the department, the program in its essence, that's something that we hope to continue to do, but nevertheless, we still need to identify ways to make sure that anyone who comes in contact with the family members has that trauma-centered uh, piece and training to do so. Um, continuing the need again for mental health services. Um, and though families decline support immediately following their loved one's death, they did reach out later at a, at a later time, right? And that's something that um, family assistance uh, program advocates noticed and and it makes sense it, it it mirrors what trauma looks like you know in the moment there's so much coming at you there's so much making sense that you have to do you don't know what you don't know and so as the days pass and the grief lingers and it gets heavier you realize I, I need extra support my mother needs extra support where do I get that and so maybe that phone call or that card that you put away that was handed to you, you realize I need that card. I, I need to, I need to reach out to, to that family assistant advocate that approached me. Um, so that's something that we've learned and we've keep we've kept in mind. And so our goal, hopefully, is that moving forward. Unfortunately, even though these situations will continue to happen, that the family assistance program has, is cognizant of that and so reaches out to the families, even if they decline service in the beginning, reaches out to them in a timely period just to check in, to see how they're doing, to see if things have changed, to see if perhaps maybe they are open to receiving that, that care that they need. Um, and so there are a few uh, priorities, uh, proposed design priorities that the program itself, that the group uh, felt were essential to, to improving the program. And at the forefront of one, it's the transition of the family uh, assistance program from a hybrid model that incorporates the OVP clinicians and staff with contracted community-based organizations to provide provision for burial assistance, support for bereaved families, um, and just uh, in navigating the county agencies and trauma-informed mental health services. Um, this really is about that. It's about bringing together all the resources that are out there in the county, right? Um, there's so many. And sometimes our, our greatest, our greatest uh, resource is just knowing that they're out there. And so we have that power. We know what's out there. And so it's essential that now we, we put all of that together and we bring in these community-based organizations that have the lived experience, that have gone through this with many different families and can sit here and come in and, and talk to them and say, hey, I, I can guide you, I can, I can tell you. Um, I just anecdotally, I, I spoke to a family member recently and they mentioned, you know, if I would have known what was ahead, what I was gonna have to face, I, I think that that would have helped me. And so that's something that all of us who, who really envision this program have, have kept in, in mind. 
Um, there's also the alignment with crisis response violence intervention, uh, with the crisis response violence intervention program. Um, CRVP, uh, the program design includes a component uh, which has a contract with a community based organization and uh, their expertise in crisis response, mental health resources, trauma informed practices, and community outreach. Again, it's about not necessarily in reinventing the wheel, but really utilizing all our resources and utilizing all our expertise to help these families to the best of our ability. Um, so that's, that's another, another priority. Um, there will also be the alignment with the OVP Trauma Prevention Initiative and uh, when Andrea joins us, I'm going to have her kind of explain that a little bit more. Um, another component was to ensure that there's uh, proper staffing of this program, um, both for not only the Office of Violence Prevention, but the Department of Medical Examiner Coroner. Um, the Office of Violence Prevention wants to hire two mental health clinicians, uh, a mental health uh, clinical supervisor, as well as a psychiatric social uh, supervisor, uh, social workers who work uh, directly with uh, the staff of OVP that already exists. Um, and for the Department of Medical Examiner Coroner, they are asking for two full-time positions of uh, DMEC social worker positions, as well as one DMEC investigator. The intent of that is all of our programs, all of our resources, whether LASD, DMEC, DOD, OIG, everybody is understaffed. And so with that in mind, uh, DMEC is, is, uh, is understaffed, is one of the departments that is understaffed, but is facing a flux in, in the, the necessity of what they do. They, they need more people. And so we hope that having one uh, extra DMEC investigator will allow um, would allow them to actually be there on call for the families so that the families don't have to wait two, three days to find out when are we going to see our, 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 the body, when are we going to receive their property, that there's already somebody within that department. And that's also something that was echoed by not only family members, by not only uh, county partners, but also by community-based organizers that mentioned that to us as well, that there was a need to have somebody in houses and DMEC that could, that could make themselves available to the families. Another priority is coordination, um, just a multidisciplinary uh, team meeting. And what that will look like hopefully is quarterly meetings where OVP, LASD, OIG, DMEC, COC, Department of Mental Health, and other community-based organizations get together and discuss the cases that have, that have been that have been brought to them. Um, discuss the implementation, any communication strategies, anything that we've seen. The goal again is to to recognize that though this program can make a difference, there will always be room for it to grow. There will always be room for it to improve. And so if we continue, right, if, if we are here to provide oversight, then we should definitely provide oversight of our, our own our own programs. And so that was one of the uh, one of the goals of that is to just make sure that we we bring everyone back to the table and we make sure that we're providing the care that that is needed. Um, there also will be uh, an opportunity for an internal and external family assistance communication. So OVP will work with family assistance partners to develop a communications plan to improve awareness of the program and increase access to services. Again, that may look like more outreach. It may look like us getting together and perhaps um, putting these uh, these brochures in all of the all of the county languages, right? The recognized county languages, making sure that the link to the site for the program is available at all of the different departments, even departments that may not necessarily be identified right now, just so that if there is somebody out there that we could reach out to, that information is uh, it finds them. Um, there's also another priority, a permanent family assistance reimbursement processing system. So OVP will continue to work with DMH to ensure that that process for reimbursement is timely and efficient. Um, and they will strive to reach out to families as quickly as possible to increase the likelihood for burial assistance and mental health services. So what that means is sometimes um, one of the challenges was identifying not only the next of kin, but also how to get in contact with them, right? And time is, time is passing and these families have to identify ways to raise money to, to bury their loved one. 
And so our goal is that we are able to facilitate that for them, that we are able to get to them and provide the service and the, and the help that they need sooner than later so that we're not later on reimbursing them for funds that they had to work together to, to get together with the community to raise because that's just that's the last thing we want. As far as all of that, we, we don't want somebody out, you know, trying to raise funds to bury their loved one. That shouldn't be that shouldn't be something that that they need to worry about in that moment. Um, and uh, also a tracking system. And this tracking system was also part of the motion um, from the, uh, the October motion. Uh, it clearly asked that we develop a tracking system um, to collect data, not only data of uh, the, the events themselves, but really it'll give us an opportunity to track the data in terms of what that means for the department, right? What that means not only for LASC, but what that means for the communities as a whole. There's a, it's a large, large county. And so if these events are taking place in specific communities, that's something that we need to take a look at, right? And that's something that we need to, to highlight and we need to figure out, well, why, why is that happening? Why out of the 10, 10 events that took place, why are six of them in two very specific neighborhoods when the county is huge, right? So uh, having this tracking system will give us the opportunity to take a look at that and really pull and synthesize information that will hopefully help us identify other systemic issues that we may not be aware exist already. Um, and so lastly, uh, really we were just here to, or I'm here to uh, uplift this program to let you know that we are in need of support so that funding, permanent funding is, is uh, identified and so that the program can live in perpetuity. It's unfortunate that this program has to exist, but it is something that is needed. And so um, one of our next steps is really just to request that the commission support the proposed design of the Family Assistance Program and urge the Board of Supervisors to allocate permanent funding for the program. Thank you. Thank you. I, I see that we have uh, Andrea Welsing here from the Office of Violence Prevention as well now. Uh, does she want to add anything? Hi. Good afternoon and uh, sorry that um, I'm late. I, I was coming from another meeting and I, um, but I heard Ingrid and, um, what, and how she described this and, and she did, you know, she said it all pretty much. I, I think the only thing that I want to add is to reiterate and echo that what she said, this should, this, a permanent family assistance program in LA County is, is the right thing to do. And there are families um, who are suffering and we are, we are eager if the board decides that to take this on and we would continue the work that DMH has built. And we would work, continue to work with them as well as other departments just to continue to build this out. And um, I think it really leverages many of the initiatives that we're already doing. And, um, and most, um, you know, some of the critical points are a couple of things is the communication. We really heard that in the listening session, making sure that people know about this program, know how to access this program, really do our work due diligence there. Also, compassionate response early on, making the system as easy to navigate as possible, and um, and that uh, really engaging community members themselves in this response, so that it's not just us and our mental health providers. It's not just um, the coroner's positions that we would like to support in terms of next of kin notification, but it is really engaging com trusted community members themselves. And um, so um, we we also we urge um, the commission to help support this program and and we are eager to start this work um, once we're given uh, the the move forward to do that or the ability to do that with the um, funding and with the uh, directive from the board. Thank you. That's all. Thank, thank you, uh, and Andrea, I think it's going to be an, L, an easy sell for this commission to support you as you uh, uh, try to create a permanent program here, because uh, um, we just really believe 
in uh, what's being done here. I'm going to open it up for commissioner comments. And I want to start with Patty, who from the beginning has been a fierce advocate for family assistance uh, of this kind. So, Patty, do you want to say anything? Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Chair Kennedy, and, and thank you, Ingrid, for such a comprehensive uh, explanation. And thank you, Andrea, for joining in and pushing this forward. I really feel that we're going to be able to institutionalize this program. This is a program that was one of the came to us from the families, the trauma impacted families. Uh, practically our first meeting at, as at the COC. Uh, and I, I just want to um, say that this is. It's not only now going to be a community based program in connection with a lot of county organizations, but county agencies, but this is a, a community initiated program 5 years ago. And I want to give a, uh, a shout out to, um. Particularly those families who came up, came forward early on and we sat many hours talking with them and, and also them coming to our, our commission sessions. Um, but. If it wasn't for Youth Justice Coalition and Dignity and Power Now, who had been organizing with those families, we would not be here today. So I really want to uh, thank th those folks. Some of them are still around, and uh, and um, um, Michelle Infante, you know who you are, early early starter of this uh, initiative. And I really want to thank the um, thank Miriam Brown and her staff at Department of Mental Health. And Max Huntsman at the Office of Inspector General, Michael Dark and Katie Butler. Um, of course, Andrea Welsing and Kelly Fisher and everyone at Department of Public Health who created the Office of Violence Prevention, which is really and makes so much sense for this program to sit there, uh, kind of at the center of, of a, a lot of railroad tracks moving out into the community. Um, and uh, it is the right thing to do. It is the right thing to do. We were able to get, I remember when it was, oh my God, I think it was three years ago that we sat at the Board of Supervisors when we were all in person, when we had the support of the board because we had the heads of every department. The coroner was there. Um, Barbara Ferrer was there from the Department of Public Health. The sheriff, totally supportive of this program. The sheriff's department, totally supportive of this program. Department of Mental Health was there. And um, it's, uh, sorry about that, it's my dog barking. Um, so that was that initial thrust of, uh, of, of, of illuminating this issue. And um, we've moved into that pilot proje project and learned so much. And now we're at this point of really need to, to make it happen. To really, we've learned so much, and one of the most important things that I think I don't want to reiterate, reiterate that uh, Ingrid talked about was families or it, it, trauma impacted people of whatever kind of trauma it is, particularly from intentional violence of any kind, are not able to come forward right away and say, "Okay, I want to heal. Bring it to me." It's a process, and sometimes it takes years. To reach out, you know, so, but so knowing that though, we can work with that and we can provide the support, to, uh, possibly facilitate easier access to the kind of support that um, trauma impacted families. This is a no fault program. And I think that was a little bit hard to get people to understand in the beginning. This is not blaming families, this is not blaming anyone for what happened. It's about taking good care. That's a trauma informed response and through this, through the families coming forward and through developing this program. And I. Part of this ad hoc with me um, is that. It really created this commission to become trauma informed. So this program has even in its infancy, and then it's like uh, moving on and growing, and then the pilot, it has already had a lot of influence, you know? And I think that's a lesson learned because, you know, we're not talking about 
hundreds of thousands of people, thank God. But we're talking about a critical number and a particular kind of group of people that we can learn from to impact all of our systems. And the fact that we know that some people don't want to, of course, people don't necessarily want to go to the sheriff's department because that's who that's who caused the death, right? That, that circumstance. But the fact that we know that they're hesitant to go to the Department of Mental Health, the Department of Public Health, that's, that's good information. We have to, the, the, these public services exist for the public. So we have to make them work. So it's not just about trust in the Sheriff's Department that has to happen, but it's trust in all the county departments. And the fact that we can focus on this and make this work and get the Board of Supervisors, of course, when you institutionalize something, that, that costs money. That costs money. And that's where the rubber meets the road. And, uh, and that's where we're at now. So I just want to appreciate everyone. It's been a long road. Um, my heart continues to go out to the families. Um, it's extraordinary, the group, the, the family members who continue to come to us even over all this time. Um, and it's so important, these continuous testimony and staying connected to the families. So um, just um, today's a good day because we're gonna go in front of the Board of Supervisors and we're gonna ask them to make this real, make this real so we can continue to learn, continue to improve. And to my mind, um, you know, it's, there's not a lot of satisfaction being a commissioner in the last couple of years, actually, if I might say that personally, I won't talk for the whole, all the commissioners, but it's hard to kind of like, because it's such a struggle, right? Um, to do our jobs as uh, overseers, right? Um, but this brings me great satisfaction that if we can get this institutionalized, house it in the right place, get all the groups to work together, this has been worth five years of struggle. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Patty. Now, don't uh, don't scare Jamone. He's a new commissioner. <laughs> Leo, Leo. Yes, um, I will echo everything that's been said. Um, I want to, um, aside from talking about all the work that that has been done, um, I again want to. Um, express my um, thanks and my gratefulness to members of the community that raised this initially, as Patty said, and continued to push and continued to push. Um, sometimes, um, as you know, uh, the members of the community, I'm speaking to them, um, we may move a little too slowly for you, but continue to push because it's important for us <clears throat> to hear from you and um, we learn a lot from you. With that said, I mean, Patty has been an, an incredible force getting this moving and Ingrid, I wanna thank you for um, <clears throat> the work that you have done, which has been um, just monumental and the dedication um, moving this forward. And Andrea, we are now in a new, in a new, um, realm and um, I am confident that this is going to happen. Um, <clears throat> but the funding, as you know, has to be significant. Otherwise, it just doesn't work. So um, if there is a um, suggestion that a motion on the part of this commission um, should be drafted, uh, voted on and, and drafted to go to the board, um, I want to um, propose that, but I would like to hear from everybody else first. I think we need to to take a very strong stand and um, pass a motion to um, encourage the board um, to make this permanent and to fully fund it. Uh, well, that sounds like a great suggestion, Leo. Is there anyone else who wants to weigh in? I'm going to say it sounds like a motion, and I'll second it. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is a motion. Um, I can, you know, we can put it in the in the right form. But um, <clears throat> I guess <clears throat> one of the questions that I have, Andrea, for you is: Do you have a dollar amount 
uh, or does anybody have a dollar amount that you're looking for to, to fully fund this? Thank you, Commissioner. I, we do. And it was in uh, the OIG report um, that was submitted on February 22nd. So um, you, you might have it, but the dollar amount we are asking for is 1.5 million, a little over that. We believe that is critical um, for all the components that we are that are needed to support a permanent ongoing family assistance program. That includes money for families for burial, but uh, but outside of that, there are other things, flexible funds to help support families, burial cost, um, but also for staffing here. In the Office of Violence Prevention, Offices of Violence Prevention don't typically have this, but what's critical and what we know is that you need mental health professionals to respond the appropriate. And so we are asking for that staffing as part of this um, request or the project design. But we also think that it is important to support uh, the medical examiner coroner so that they have capacity to do the next of kin notifications they, and to do that in a trauma-informed way. And so really that's part of it as well. So the, there's many pieces to what's in that budget. I'm happy to provide the detailed budget if you don't have it, but um, the, the, the ultimate um, dollar amount is a little over 1.5 million a year. And, and not only do we, as we are saying, and as all of you are saying, is it the right and compassionate and ethical thing to do? But that is, I also believe it's cost effective. You know, this is this, you know, if we treat people compassionately and fairly, um, I think we just, um, there's real, there's real benefit to that in many ways. So anyway, the short answer to your question is, is a little over 1.5 million. I'll stop there. Um, uh, if, uh, then what I'd like to do is make a motion, um, authorizing the, um, the board of supervisors to fully fund, um, the, um, family assistance program and, um, in the amount of 1.5 million annually. Um, and. Anyway, I think that that would be the basis of the motion. So I make that motion. And JP, I think you seconded it already. And I will, I will second that, yes. And Great. so maybe someone who knows uh, the procedures better than I do, I can tell me, do we take public comment before we vote or do we vote now? Yes, let's take public sure. comment Go beforehand. Go ahead, Thanks. Brian. Yeah, you have to take public comment. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Uh, so should we do that? Um, Jennifer, should we take public comment on the family assistance program a presentation we just had, and then we'll uh, end with a vote on uh, Lael's motion. Mr. Chair, I just want one point of clarification. Uh, Commissioner Rubin, you said a motion uh, authorizing the Board of Supervisors to give this $1.5 million. Did you mean urging the board? Yes, I did. Thank you for uh, okay. your correction. And I assume Thank that. You. Commissioner Harris will continue his second. Yes, yes, I do. Thank you. Okay, and before we begin with uh, the public comment, first we'll have Tamara Kay, but Ingrid, would you like to provide the Spanish announcement? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, si necesita traducción a sus comentarios, por favor, simplemente diga la palabra español antes de comenzar. Y alguien le dará instrucciones de cómo proceder. Gracias. Great. And we'll have two minutes per person. Tamara K, you're unmuted. Please begin. Can you hear me? Yes. Th um, thank you for the presentation, um, Ms. Williams. Um, like you said, it, it really is a shame we could have to have these uh, programs in place, but um, they're necessary. Um, fully fund this program, I would say, you know, we need community based programs and people um, that are trained and have experience and they should definitely be black and brown led because these are the communities most impacted. Um, there should be no law enforcement or sheriff involved in these programs. These are the people and 
I think Ms. Giggins even said, responsible for this trauma. So they should be no way in shape and form or form involved in this process of healing and family assistance. And I don't think county workers should be either. Um, uh, also, um, what, what does access look like as far as families obtaining access to these programs in a timely manner? You know, it shouldn't take a long time to receive this assistance. Um, and also, you know, we need to support the uh, charter amendment, the ACLU um, implemented to impeach the sheriff and strengthen the COC power once again. Um, I, I fully support the family um, assistance program. And again, I can't say enough or reiterate enough that these should be community based programs led by black and brown community members that have experience and are trained. Um, and thank you for your time. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. And next we will hear from Richie Serjinko. You're unmuted. Please go ahead, Richie. Hi, yes, this is Richie Serdanko from the People City Council. Um, you know, I want to applaud the uh, the Office of the Inspector General for its uh, thorough reporting on the pilot family assistance program um, and the commitment to families who have lost loved ones to share violence, misconduct, and neglect. Um, you know, this is the very least that the county can do. Um, you know, to provide messengers who are trained in trauma informed practices and can provide empathy and support during the worst days of a person's life. Um, in order for a social worker to provide effective notification, uh, the sheriff department must must share details of a person's death quickly. Um, next of kin have a right to know the answers to the very basic questions about their loved ones deaths. Um, the budget proposed, however, uh, does not sufficiently account for the funds needed for burial costs. Um, you know, first, the OIG estimates that 50 families will need these services every year. However, in 2021, 55 people died in custody and LASD fatally shot 11 more. Um, that's a universe of 66 families just last year. There's no basis to estimate a lower number for 2022, considering they've already killed four people this year. Uh, the sheriff's deputy shot and killed four people this year, and I'm, I'm sure uh, they have continued the practice of, of negligence and violence in the jails, and we won't see a decrease in those numbers. Um, the report also notes that money for burial services ran out sometime in 2021. We recommend that the OIG ask for funds to cover all eligible expenses for families who need support. Um, our positive recommendations here should not disguise the fact that we need the the program because sheriff's department is killing people and letting people die in custody. Um, encounters with the sheriff's deputy, whether on patrol. Let's conclude your time. And next, we will hear from Julie Martinez. As a reminder, if you would like to provide a public comment regarding the family assistance program, please raise your hand now in the participant window. And if you are calling in, please press star three on your phone. Julie, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you to the OIG and, and to the commission. This is real change. This is real change that what we really need from you. I, I wanted to go through the very various different steps of grief and trauma that have occurred. First, the first the killing by a sheriff, deputy sheriff occurs and the family is in severe shock. Then the discovery and the details of what happened to their loved one creates more shock that the body was left on the street on the street. No um, emergency vehicles arrived to administer aid, even though we can clearly see through through whistleblower video that was secretly recorded that the that our loved ones were still alive. Then the coroner, the step with the coroner creates another level of trauma because as we know, the coroner has been complicit with law enforcement almost targeting, almost crafting their reports to, to be in line with the sheriffs. Then the notice of the family comes by someone who is not, who's ill-equipped to provide such a, such a horrible notice. Then the, then the day or the day after we gather at the memorial site and who rolls up, not street gangs, but the sheriff deputy bandito gangs from the East LA station, 14 sheriff deputy gangs, 
um, mocking, laughing at the family. That's another level of tra trauma. Then as the family becomes more, more outspoken, the harassment continues, the doxing by the sheriff, photos released of their names, the harassment and the trauma continues. Three years past the killing of my grandson, my family is still facing harassment. So what I would like to highlight in this program, please acknowledge that counseling must continue beyond just a few years because sheriff damages continue through harassment. And I did see my family suffer and counseling is needed. And a last thank you to all of you. Thank you, Julie. And next we will hear from Helen Jones. Please go ahead, Helen. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to the OIG and to the commission for um, creating the Family Assistance Program. And please continue to make this um, program um, permanent for the families. Because when my son John Horton was beat to death um, by the 3,000 boy deputy sheriff gang, um, it was nothing like this for the families. Um, you know, families that didn't, that couldn't afford uh, funeral costs, um, burial. You know, we had to um, get out and you know, you know, come together with different family members, communities to make this happen for our families. So I just really want to say thank you um, for making this possible for the families. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Melissa Camacho Chung. You're unmuted. Please go ahead, Melissa. Hello, this is Melissa Camacho Chung from the ACLU Southern California. Uh, I just want to echo the gratitude uh, from the families here for this program. Um, while it should not be necessary, it obviously is. Uh, I also want to to ask for an amended motion uh, as a previous caller suggested uh, the money put forward by the OIG does not sufficiently account for the families that will be needing this money. Uh, it should be at least 70 families per year uh, and not the current 50 for both burial, incidental and mental health needs. I recognize that uh, in today's presentation, it said that only about 24 out of the 115 eligible families uh, accessed funds in this pilot program. However, with the efforts uh, that are already underway to make this, this uh, program more readily known, uh, we have to assume that all families and loved ones who need the support will be able to access it and won't be turned away because of a lack of money, um, especially because the money apparently ran out sometime in 2021. And at least one family member that I uh, recommended contact the Family Assistance Program after her son died in Twin Towers in 2021 was not able to access any funds. Funds. So additional bridge funding is needed, not just for families going forward, but to look for families um, in the past years that have not yet received money uh, to be able to have the support they need. Um, I also ask that the commission, when you go before the board, to make it very clear uh, that the problem is the sheriff's department, the negligence in custody, the killings in patrols. And while this program is important, it cannot hide the fact that the biggest problem is with Sheriff Villanueva and the lack of accountability, the lack of discipline, and uh, the people on patrol and in the jails uh, acting as if they do not care that our fellow citizens are dying. Thank you very much. Thank you, Melissa. Next, we'll hear from Pastor Q Jean Marie. You're unmuted. Please go ahead. Yes, um, I would. Again, like to echo everyone else by commending and thanking uh, the families, first of all, who fought for this, for the Family Assistance Program, and also uh, to the OIG, the community, as well as the commission uh, for implementing this. And definitely like to, would like to echo if we can send $13 billion to Ukraine, we can take care of our people here as well, right? It's not either or, but it's both and. Uh, and uh, this helps to create an environment of compassion, um, which is what I was talking about in my previous um, in my previous comments. We worked hard, right? It's good to see this, 
but I want to remind us that it took us from the first meeting of the COC in January 27, 2017. We've been working since 2015 to make sure that we had uh, this type of committee that would look at, um, listen to the community. So it's been five years we've been asking for this and better late than never. Uh, but at the same time, I hope moving forward, we can create a community of compassion and uh, when people make mistakes or when people commit crimes, we don't punish the entire community. We don't punish the entire family um, because what we do when we do things like that is that we create an environment of they versus us, we versus them. Uh, and so we've got to be better at not criminalizing people and, and, and satisfying our need for punishment and our need, um, you know, instead of looking for justice, we tend to want to punish people. But thank you for your, your work. We thank commit. you. And next, and next we'll hear from Yanira Reynoso. Please go ahead, Yanira. Yanira, we are not hearing you. I'll chat with you and come back to you in a little bit. Next, we'll move to Hilda Pedroza. You're unmuted. Please go ahead, Hilda. Yes, hello. I'm Hilda Pedrosa, I'm sister of David Ordaz Jr. And I am very grateful for this family pro assistance program, which uh, we actually did access. Um, I do recommend that we have someone from the community outside of the county employees to immediately come and let the families know of this assistance and anything else that you're able to give. Um, and in our circumstances, um, we received the 1099 NEC form, which um, actually uh, is affecting our taxes. Um, I would recommend to look into getting a 1099 MISC miscellaneous, um, which wouldn't affect our taxes as much. So this is a downfall, and I wish I would have been uh, notified of this before, not once I'm already doing my taxes. So this is something that we need to also implement in this program where we are letting the families know exactly what it takes to get this money or any other services from them. Also, I think 50 families is not enough. We need more money because in our case alone, we have five families who have been immediately impacted. This is all my siblings who were outside along with our children when we watched our brother being executed by LASD. Um, also, we need to somehow get um, dignity and power involved because dignity and power is, is the one um, uh, or who is actually giving us without having to put any of our insurance um, mental health. So um, we need to let uh, people know about all the situation, all the, the stuff that's actually given to us and that it's not really just money that we're getting. So thank you very much. Thank you. And next we will hear from Andres. Juan and Andres will be the last speaker. We'll try to go back to Yanira one last time, but that, that is all of the people who have signed up. If you have not spoken yet, but you would like to comment on the Family Assistance Program, please raise your hand. Andres, you're unmuted. Please go ahead now. Hi, uh, Andres Juan, ACLU. Uh, uh, what we heard uh, from Paul Red's grandmother, Julie, this morning is that we've been facing an all out human rights crisis in our county at the hands of uh, Sheriff Villanueva and his deputies. Uh, we've heard time and time again about uh, how on top of black and brown families having to survive deputies and deputy gang members and prospects uh, targeting and killing their loved ones, they, they've also been surviving their, their harassment, relentless harassment, often by, this, by the very same deputies uh, who kill their loved ones. Uh, as you heard from Julie, they, they've, and they face a campaign of intimidation, retaliation, trying to silence them and chill their First Amendment rights. And this should obviously not be surprising to the COC uh, and oversight officials who uh, receive a, a, a very similar uh, harassment and, and, and intimidation tactics. Uh, and this has been so extreme that in some cases, many family members have left the county, fled the county, really out of, the, out of fear for their lives. And as an immigrant rights lawyer at the ACLU, I have to tell you that in international human rights refugee and refugee law and in this country's own asylum law, these families who fit the definition of refugees who are being persecuted on account of a particular social group or political opinion. Uh, it, so 
one you heard uh, from Julie about Villanueva's press conference on February 23rd, but that wasn't the first time. Uh, on May 4th, uh, we released a report on the Sheriff's Department harassment of families focusing on the families of Anthony Vargas and Paul Rea. And the day after, Villanueva on his Instagram live singled them out and identified them by name. Um, also, you may have seen Villanueva's letter uh, to the board about deputy gangs, and in it, he named Valerie Vargas, the, on, the aunt of Anthony Vargas, who is the only non-politician he could criticize in this letter. Uh, I can't, you know, I could tell you eh, eh, how this is so dangerous, uh, but you, you should, you probably know already. But in, in terms of the FAP, we support it wholeheartedly. Uh, we want to make sure that funding and goes that to community-based organizations like time. EPA. Andres, thank you very much. Um, and Yanira, as I noted in the chat, please send an email to cocnotify at coc.lacounty.gov. And that goes for any community member who would like more information about this program or anything related to the Civilian Oversight Commission. And Chair Kennedy, that does conclude, oh, yes, that does conclude all of the public comments on this item. Thank you. Uh, my only question is, uh, Lil, you've made this uh, motion. We got some input from a couple of members of the public that perhaps the dollar amount is too low. Do you want to uh, amend it in any way or? Um, I, I do not at this point in time. And the reason I don't um, is that um, when this issue comes before the board, um, that as a way of um, urging the board to approve the 1.5 million, that we also speak or the commission speaks about the fact that currently um, the amount of money allotted um, for um, uh, for burial benefits and, and other benefits has been insufficient um, and that the board needs to understand the importance of doing that. So that's a long way of saying, um, I think this added information can be helpful in making sure that the board um, moves um, quickly and realizes the impact and the seriousness of this rather than increasing uh, the dollar amount now. Okay. I have a question. Do we know when is, do we know when the board is it, is it looking at it um, this month? Do we know when the board is gonna be taking this up as an agenda item? Brian, maybe you could help us on that. Yeah, I'm not sure our, our report date, this is June. So I'm not quite sure of the date we'll find out. But I think, you know, we'll, we'll take the motion and we'll send a notification to the board, but it might be helpful for us to have a representative from the commission uh, when we find out that date at the actual board meeting for a public comment. Oh, yeah, sure. I, I, I'm def, I'm definitely plan on showing up that day. I'll tell you that. And uh, maybe some other commissioners will join me. I was going to um, urge Patty. Who's been the, the, um, the, the voice and the, the strong. A mover in this to be um, to be present, and um, I also agree that other members of the commission um, should be available to be present as well. Let's um, let's take a vote then on Lil's motion. Uh, Commissioner Harris. Yes. Commissioner Hicks? Yes. Commissioner Gagan? Yes. Chair Kennedy? Yes. Commissioner Rubin? Yes. Please the motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Two more minutes. I'm almost done. See the people. I think um, that is the conclusion of our meeting. It's about 20 minutes before one. And so uh, unless there's anything uh, that I've missed from the commission, we're going to adjourn. I want to um, thank our incredible staff for making this um, 
virtual meeting happened so smoothly. I had no idea uh, how much work you do until today. So big thanks to everyone. And our next meeting is Thursday, April 21st, 2022. I believe that will still be a virtual meeting. Is that right, Brian? Yes, unless otherwise know that, but I'm pretty sure it's gonna be a virtual meeting. Okay, so I, I think uh, I wanna thank the people who stayed with us so long, the community input, uh, means so much as we saw today with the family assistance program. And I hope everyone has a very happy St. Patrick's Day. And thanks to you, Chair Kennedy, for a, uh, Thank you. An, uh, a very well done meeting. Thank you. Thanks for putting up with me, commissioners. <laughs> you did a great job, Sean. Great <laughs> job. Great job. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.